I'm Coyote Peterson. How do you guys think I would look? With a blonde mustache. The rainforests of Costa Rica are filled with beautiful animals. However, sometimes the most stunning creatures can also be the most dangerous. Defensive appearances are everything on the Osa Peninsula. Whether it's camouflage to keep you hidden, look at that gross bugger. Uh, and I know everybody's watching me right now saying, Coyote, are you gonna get stung by the toe biter today? Absolutely not. Or bright colors to warn predators that you would be one toxic treat. It's all about survival of the best hidden or best dressed. But what if you don't care to hide? And what if you were not born with bright colors? but instead, one soft looking cuddly coat, which conceals beneath it an armor of venomous spines. Get ready to meet the Furry Puss Caterpillar. Holy cow, look at this, look at this caterpillar. What are you looking at? Whoa. You don't know what that is, do you? No, no I this wouldn't touch that. is what the locals call a fire caterpillar. You sure that's a caterpillar? Oh yeah. Watch out, I'm gonna bend this branch down because I don't want him to fall on my face. I would be in pain for hours. Look at that. It looks like a mustache. I don't exactly know the proper name for this caterpillar. This caterpillar has many nicknames. On the Osa Peninsula, it's known as the fire caterpillar. However, it is more commonly called the furry puss caterpillar because it so closely resembles a fuzzy kitty cat. In the world of science, this is actually a flannel moth caterpillar. But don't let their adorable and cuddly looks fool you. This fuzzy puss is covered in urticating hairs, and if you're unfortunate enough to make skin contact, these hairs can be extremely irritating. What's even worse is that just below the hairs are venomous spines. Get a handful of those, and for nearly 12 hours, you will be in excruciating pain. I'm pretty sure that the little bristles that will do you damage are on the other side of this fur. Let me take a look in there. Oh boy, can you see that? Oh yeah. Look at that. Those are what dig into your skin. And you go to pet it and you're like, ah, your hand is on fire. And actually, I think I got a couple of them that touched my finger because my finger's starting to itch. I'm sure you guys are thinking, oh, come on, coyote, just touch it. No, 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 no. My hand will feel like it is on fire. Now, it's tough to tell which end of this guy is the head. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this end is the head because as you can see, he's eating a hole right through that leaf. And we've caught this caterpillar right in the middle of dinner. And I'm sorry that I had to bug you in the middle of dinner, Mr. Caterpillar, but you were just far too bizarre looking for us to not get in front of the cameras. All right, let's see if we can get this fuzzy little caterpillar to show us his underside. Check this out, watch this. Look at that. Dancing. I just wanted to get him off the leaf, now watch. Look at that. Can you see his underside? Yeah. Kind of Looks like a tremor, doesn't it? See all those little legs? Like suction cups that allows him to move up and down tree trunks and his mouth is on the end of his head and he gnaws away at the leaves. Wow, just when I thought the rainforest of Costa Rica couldn't get any more bizarre, we come across this obscure looking caterpillar, somewhere between a sheepdog and a blonde mustache. These caterpillars are venomous. However, there are no reported cases of contact that have resulted in death. If you are ever stung, the best first aid is a cold ice pack applied to the location of the sting, and antihistamines can be administered to help with the itching and burning. All right, Donnie. We'll see you later, buddy. Enjoy your leaf. Lesson to be learned here, if you see a caterpillar that looks soft and fuzzy, do your absolute best to avoid cuddling with it. There's an old saying that things go bump in the night. And if you are out exploring the darkness of Costa Rica's most diverse region, the Osa Peninsula, those things that go bump also stalk stealthily in the shadows, just before they charge, pounce, and attack. Whoa, that's a wild ocelot. And she's right here at my feet. Look at that! How cool is that? Fortunately for me, in the encounter you were about to witness, I was about to become a playmate, and not an item, 
on the Rainforest Nightly Menu. Okay, so let me tell you what we have going on here. This is really unique. Uh, we're out night herping, looking for reptiles and amphibians. Walking down the trail, I literally stop and I'm shining my light on this giant wolf spider, biggest wolf spider I've ever seen. And out of the darkness, I hear, and boom, an ocelot just zooms right past me. And let me see if I can get her back. She likes my snake stick. Wait for this. There she is. See that? She's gonna come right up here. Ah! Ah! She's attacking my arm. Where are you? Come here. Come here. Come here. Ah. Oh, there she is. Look what I got in my hands. Look at that ocelot. Hey, buddy. Wow. And she is a lot heavier than you would think. Okay, can you stay here for the scene? We can play with the snake stick. She's gonna be all over the place while we're filming. This is a wild cat. However, she is used to humans. She hangs out on this trail. We were told if you walk this trail at night, there's a good chance that you will come across her. Let's see, what else do I maybe have for you to play with? Let's see what we got in my pack. I'm sure there's something in here that a little ocelot would love. Oh, yep, yeah, there we go. Took the pack off and now she's on my back. Maybe just the pack itself. Look at that. Oh yeah. Can we wrestle with the back? Wrestle with the back. Huh? Get it. Get it. Look at that coloration. Now this cat blends so perfectly into its environment. All this cryptic patterning allows them to stay hidden in the shadows as they're moving through all of this foliage. Come here. You come here for a second. I'm just gonna hold on to you and, and, and take the risk of a bite, oh, and a scratch, a paw to the face, a paw to the face. <laughs> How about a little belly rub? Yeah, I hear you talking. You got that pack? Can you see her face? Oh, look at that. Now this is just like a big house cat. She's only about half grown right now, but look at, she weighs about 25 pounds. Oh, I see you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, ah, yeah. Oh, she's biting my ear. Oh, she's biting. Ow. Was that a kiss or a bite? Oh, you're so cute. You're so cute. You are. Don't go for my jugular, though. These cats are lethal once fully grown, and they can take down pretty much anything that's out here in the Costa Rican rainforest. All they have to do is run, leap, sink in those front claws, and then a bite to the jugular. And she's got a meal. Whew, that was crazy. Kissed by an ocelot. Where'd you go? There she is. And the pounce. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mario. Uh oh. Got oh, the man. camera, man. Now she has found the microphone. Oh. No, no. Mark, I think we need a new mic. We, ju we just need one for ocelots to play with. I knew it was a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting creepy crawlies, not something as cute. Oh, as an ocelot. <laughs> you, you gotta get that landing down, you know that? That's what she does. She's been leaping, come here, from log to log, and she literally launches over the log. Oh, yeah, well, let go, she says. Oh. So, Coyote, is this rare? This is probably the most unique thing I have ever done with an animal. Ah, yeah, she's got hold of me now. There, see, that's what she would want. She's going for the jugular, and hopefully she just doesn't bite me hard. Ah, okay. All right, I'm keeping my eyes closed so I don't take a claw in the eyeball. That would be bad. Look at so, this. So just so everybody knows, this is not a captive animal. No, this is a wild ocelot, 100% wild right now. Now, I would never recommend you go out in the wild and ever try to get this close to an ocelot because if it didn't want to play, it could really do some serious damage. And she is just loving me right now. You are just the most adorable thing I think I've ever met. Your hat's all messed up. Well. <laughs> Yeah, probably did a number on my hat, didn't you? Let's so is see. This, is this a kitten? This is a kitten. She's probably only a few months old. And you can see those paws. Come here, let's take a look at your paws. You see those paws right there? I see, yep, you try to whack me in the face with those paws. Those paws are how they climb so well through this rainforest ecosystem. Is she behind me right now? Yeah, you're probably gonna get pounded. I feel like when I make these sort of movements, that's when she pounces. And that's what they do. They creep up really slowly, staying hidden. And then they see a sudden movement like this. Ah, and they do that, a paw in the mouth. They go right for the neck or the head in this case. Ah, geez, I just got bit in the eye. And then they have their dinner. Ouch. Ooh, ooh, she's licking my ear. That feels weird. I've never had my ear licked before by an ocelot. First time for everything. Ah. Yep, ooh, that's good. She's training right there. She's going for the back of my neck. Hopefully she's not gonna inflict that death wound. Ow, 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 ow. Ah, yeah, okay. 
I guess you're there. Ow, I see you. You're so playful. Now, if I was one of her litter mates, this is exactly how she'd be playing. You know, those claws are sharp. The teeth are sharp. I'm getting slight little itty bitty punctures here and there, but nothing that I can't take. Not to be this close to such a cool rainforest creature. I'm sure it's probably pretty hard to believe what you just witnessed. Coyote Peterson, palling around with a wild ocelot. But believe it or not, it's completely true. For nearly three hours, this curious cat followed the crew and I through the rainforest, as we observed and filmed her behaviorisms in a totally natural habitat. This sort of an encounter with a wild animal is something one can only dream of. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have shared these moments in time with one truly special cat. Over the past two years, we have produced more than 250 episodes on the Brave Wilderness channel. And on each adventure, we do our best to get animals up close with the cameras. However, there are many animals that have eluded me over the years, including the largest frog species in Costa Rica, the Smoky Jungle Frog. Ah! That's what happened last time. Every time the Smoky Jungle Frog outs me! While visiting the Caribbean coast, we spent time exploring the dense rainforests of the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Preserve. This location was a prime habitat for these giant amphibians. Long night, battling rainstorms, and finally, it looks like we have a jungle frog that is not by its hole. But it is right next to a pond. If you can hear all those frogs croaking, this guy can literally leap off the embankment and into the water. My biggest challenge would be getting close enough to actually catch one. These frogs are very in tune with their environment and always have an escape route nearby that allows them to quickly avoid predators. Oh, oh. hold on. Jeez. All right, I'm out of here. Coming up. Ah. Yeah, well. Catching smoky jungle frogs is about the hardest thing I've faced in quite some time here in Costa Rica. But do not fear, I will catch one. Oh, this is... We continued searching into the night and traveled deeper into the jungle where we came upon a swampy lagoon. We do have another smoky jungle frog up here on the embankment. It is uh, definitely gonna be way more difficult to catch than even the last one. Let's move up slow with the lights. And this is I give you a shot on him, Mark. He is, look at the eye shine up there underneath that branch, you see it? Where? Up underneath, like go, see this skinny log across the thick log? Look straight up from that on the embankment. See it dark right there? No. Oh yeah, 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 there he is, he's right behind a leaf. is a smoky jungle frog right there. Okay, Here, we need to get out of this pond and into a controlled situation. Oh, what a slimy beast. Wow, okay, um, let's get this guy out of the pond and up onto the trail. I give you a high five except my hand is covered in frog mucus. I appreciate that. Yes! All right. Wow, what a catch. Nice grab, man. Finally, yes! I'm not sure we could have gotten that one any better. What a grab. Oh. I'm rolling. There it is. The famous sound that they make. Wow. <laughs> that is the alarm sound that we were home. Oh, I hear you. They are famous for making that loud croaking alarm sound. You hear that? Now, if you were a predator, you came in here and you grabbed a hold of this frog and it did that. That. It would be startling, and you would likely drop the frog, and it would escape. I, I hear you. Yes, 
Wow, the vocal cords on that frog are incredible. Now, a secondary defense is you see all this mucus that is coming off of the frog's body. That is slightly toxic and it is actually burning really bad on my fingers right now. I have a couple of cuts. You can see it looks like foam. Now that mucus not only keeps the frog moist, but it also deters any potential predators. Oh, I know, I hear you little buddy. Now I'm not hurting the frog in any way whatsoever. You see it's puffing up its body. He's like a balloon right now. Yes, I know, but you have, have you not figured out that you've already been captured? Yeah? <laughs> I don't know what that was, but Oh, I'm so excited we caught this frog. Now they are incredibly strong. These back legs are solid muscle. Now, Mark, look at this frog's toes. What is it missing? Webbing? That's right, because this is a terrestrial species. Now, they're oftentimes living in burrows, and that is what these frogs have been escaping into all night, or up underneath root cavities. But this one was right on the edge of a pond, likely hunting, because they are ambush predators. And no wonder, look at how big it is. Wow, you are just a beast. Oh, it's incredible. Now, all amphibians have toxins in their skin. I've handled many amphibians on this trip to Costa Rica, but nothing has actually made my hands burn yet. And all of that foam in all the little small cuts on my fingers is stinging really, really bad right now. So I won't be able to hold on to the frog for too long, but what amazing coloration. Now, you can see how this frog looks just like the leaf litter. So if it was kind of down here on the ground, just hiding underneath things amongst the leaves. Now during the day, they will do that. Just stay hidden on the forest floor. And you can see that very distinct camouflage on the back looks exactly like the cutouts in some of these leaves and the ferns. And if you lift the frog up, get that little piece. Oh, oh, he's squeezing me with those front arms. They're, oh, 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 oh. oh I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. Oh. Man, he's slippery, isn't he? Unbelievably slippery. Well, all oh, that man, mucus. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't gonna let this one get away. <laughs> <laughs> this frog is definitely making us. Oh, I'm sorry, but you got mud on your face. You got mud on your face. It's okay. Here, hold on a second. I've got a. Yeah, you got, got a bottle of water. water. Here we go. A little drink. There we go. And we have to switch it off a little bit. I'm covered in mud too. This probably isn't helping, but I want you guys to be able to see the beautiful camouflage of this frog's face. They are absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of like a giant wood frog. There we go. It has gold in it. It's you, yes. Look at the eyes, amber and gold. Beautiful, look at that. Okay, hold on just a second longer. Now, I do believe this is a male because you can see on the fingers here, they have these little hooks and that helps them to hold on to the females during the breeding process. And actually during breeding season, the male's forearms get significantly bigger and one of their defense postures uh, and to defend their territories because they're very territorial, they will puff up their bodies, push their arms out like big bodybuilders and then defend their territory from other impressing males. Now here's something that's really interesting about the tadpoles of these frogs. Now they lay their nests in like a giant clump of foam and as the tadpoles are developing, the ones that grow quicker end up eating the smaller ones. So in a sense, this frog is a cannibal. Buddy, you eat your own kind, that's kind of crazy. Wow, <laughs> oh man, what a catch. And a second catch diving right there into the mud. Can you show us the legs? Oh, oh that's a risky game, but let me see what I can do here. Yeah, I like to see the, uh, do the not stripes. I want to lose the frog. Oh, 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 he's very slippery. Now, the mucus that he's secreting makes him even more slippery. That's that's about as far as I can show you right okay, there. Okay, cool. Does that help? Yeah. It really looks like tiger stripes. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Now, this is the largest frog species here in Costa Rica. They do get a bit bigger than this, but as compared to the ones we've seen tonight, this is an absolute giant. Look at that frog. Wow. What a night. It took us hours, but we finally managed to catch the one amphibian that has been eluding me every time I've been in Costa Rica, the Smoky Jungle Frog. Ow. Oh, he's saying goodbye. I think he's ready to go. We're gonna set him down right here and he's gonna plop all the way back down into the water. Oh, <laughs> did you see that distance? That was awesome. What a night. What's going on, Coyote Pack? 
Right now we're in Costa Rica filming episodes at a location called Kids Saving the Rainforest. And today I'm at an animal that I absolutely must introduce you to. Get ready to meet the most adorable animal in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, say hello to B-Rad. This creature is just unbelievably adorable. That's a hat. Oh, goodness. Selfie with the sloth. Hi. Now, B-Rad is a baby three-toed sloth. Yeah, wanna give me a high three? High three. There you go. Now, what's really interesting about these creatures is they're called three-toed sloths, but actually the front feet are the fingers. Now, they use these three claws to help them climb around in the treetops. This is an arboreal species. He looks like a little yeti. That's a hat. You probably have never seen a cowboy hat before. He's like, hmm, maybe I should climb up here. But I don't think we're gonna let you go up there, little buddy. Why don't you stay down here on your stuffed sloth? Is that a sloth teddy bear? Yeah, this is a stuffed sloth, a plush sloth, and a real sloth. I love the gray and whitish coloration of the fur and that very distinct raccoon looking mask on the face. And you know what I love about the hair of a sloth? It all kind of grows from the sides backwards and that's so that when they're hanging upside down from tree limbs, if it rains, the water runs right off of them. You see that? It's like all grows up towards the spine instead of the spine down. Now, B-Rad is smaller than most baby sloths, and the staff here at the sanctuary believes that he may have been malnourished when he was out there in the wild, and it could be part of the reason that he fell out of a tree. Fortunately, he was brought here to the sanctuary, and they're going to provide him with all the nourishment that he needs so he can grow bigger and stronger and eventually be released back out into the wild. Now, baby sloths make a really interesting noise, and B-Rad's not making it, but they do go, I'm talking to you. I can speak sloth. <laughs> yeah. That right there is a Cecropia leaf. Let's see if B-Rat is hungry. Oh, he's going for it. Oh. oh, goodness. Do you see that? Uh, I don't know what's cuter. The baby sloth itself, or the baby sloth eating a leaf? Now, sloths have a very specific diet. As you can imagine, being up in the treetop canopy, they're consuming leaves, mainly leaves. These are Cecropia leaves right here. And the sloth has a very slow digestive system. All of that plant matter builds up in their digestive tract. And every seven days, they climb down from the treetops to the forest floor, find a nice little spot, dig a hole with their tail. Yeah, the tail, this little tiny nubbin, kind of looks like a shovel. They dig a hole, they do their business, and then as long as a predator doesn't catch and eat it, the sloth climbs back up its tree, goes about its business eating leaves, and waits another seven days before it makes its next number two. B-Rad, is it almost time for you to go number two? He's like, don't bug me, I'm eating my salad. B-Rad, I'm gonna just... Save that for later. You know what, I think I could spend my entire afternoon hanging out with a sloth. Just you and me, B-Rad. We could go on little walks together. I bet you'd fit in my pocket. I don't think they want me to put you in my pocket, but you would look really cute in my front shirt pocket. You like that? You like that idea? I think he's signing to me right now. He's saying, man, I'd love to hang out. You could come on adventures. You can meet the crew. You can meet Mario. You could meet Mark. We could all be buddies. What do you think? Now, here at the sanctuary, they oftentimes have sloths come in almost on a daily basis, especially during the time of year when baby sloths are being born. And it is sad that sometimes these babies fall out of the tree and a lot of times they become victim to predators. But every once in a while, you have a human that comes along and finds the sloth first, and that ends up here at a place like Kids Saving the Rainforest, where they can be rehabilitated, taken care of, given lots of love and nourishment, and eventually released back out into the wild. And that eventually will be the story for B-Rad, another incredible success story here at Kids Saving the Rainforest. And in just probably a few months, you will be back out there in the rainforest, living the sloth life. Well, how cool is this? Spending just a few moments getting up close with B-Rad, the adorable three-toed sloth. Oh, look at that yawn. 
Who's ready for a nap? No matter how brave you may be, I'm willing to bet that there's something you are afraid of. Fears, or phobias as they are known in the medical sciences community, can come in many shapes and sizes. When it comes to the fear of spiders, properly known as arachnophobia, I think it's safe to say that this fear also comes with many legs. What are you looking at? Look at this. That's a golden silk orb weaver. Look at the size of that spider. And that's a female, for sure. The males are smaller. Whoa, whoa, there's more over here. Oh, the whole side of this house is covered in them. Look at this. Wow. Look oh, at man. this. Oh, look at they're all running. Oh, look at this one right here. And now it's Oh. That right there is a big spider. Oh, boy. You know, it might be interesting. Why don't we do an episode like we did with the Black Widow, where I free handle one of these spiders to find out if it bites or not. What do you think? Oh man, they're definitely very impressive looking. Look at that. Yeah, a lot bigger than the Black Widow, that's for sure. I have handled many species of spiders. And whether they are huge and hairy, like the desert tarantula, or sleek and toxic, like the Black Widow, it never fails to send shivers down my spine as they skitter along my arms. Oh my. Going right onto the edge of my finger. Oh boy, okay, now she's coming down my arm. She's actually spun a little thread of web. Like she's becoming secured to me. Oh, I thought she was about to bite. One of my underlying goals has always been to help people face their fear of spiders. So today, I will be handling one of the most common, yet scariest looking arachnids in Central America, the golden orb weaver. But first, I have to catch one. Wow, that is a massive web. Look at the anchor points down here that then run all the way up into the hot zone. Uh, this spider's got a good cache of food already stored up, but given the fact that there are not too many guard strands on the outside here, I think I might be able to actually catch this one. All right, should we go for it? Let's do it. Let me see if I can get her to come right down. Can you go to her? Definitely her. Ah, I'm losing it. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Nice. There we go. Whoa, that is a big spider right there. And I bet anybody watching right now who has arachnophobia is thinking to themselves, Coyote, you are absolutely crazy. Okay, let's bring it out here from under the overhang. There we go. Staying completely still on the stick. Look at that. Arachnid. Wow. One impressive specimen. Ooh, okay. Going up to the top of the stick. Look at those hooked legs. That will make your skin crawl. Okay, Mark, give me that little plastic cube. Real slowly, before it drops down on me. Got it, got it, got it, got it. I'm gonna see if I can get her to slowly walk in there. Okay, there we go. Whoa. Got it. Wow, that is one intimidating arachnid right there. All right, let's get this spider into a controlled situation and see just how dangerous it really is. Warning, spider bites can be incredibly dangerous and potentially fatal. Never attempt to catch or handle a spider. All right, now I am gonna keep my spider stick with me just in case I need to balance the animal on it at some point. Oh boy. You see it up in its web and you're like, oh, it's not that big until you get it inside of a clear plastic cube and it's right next to your face. It's a lot bigger up close and personal. All right, I'm going to take off my pack so I have a little more mobility. Now, like Arizona's Black Widow, 
This spider is oftentimes found in residential areas and they build their webs all over man-made structures. So it's a species that you oftentimes stumble upon. However, because they're web builders, they stick to their webs. Now people do encounter them because if you're out there in the rainforest, they oftentimes will span their webs between two trees. And like in one of those famous adventure movies, if you're walking through the rainforest at night, whack, you may walk straight into a web and find this spider on your person. Now these spiders are armed with a neurotoxic venom, which will attack the nervous system of their prey. And what these spiders are out here feasting on is any sort of insect that is unfortunate enough to fly into their webs. However, some of these spiders manage to grow large enough where they can actually take lizards, and I've seen pictures on the internet of ones that have eaten small birds and bats. How crazy is that? Now those are the ones that are in Australia, the ones here in Central and South America don't grow quite as big, and there are actually 23 recognized species worldwide. This actually spider people often see in Florida, and they show up in bananas. Did you know that? They're actually also known as the banana spider. They've been transported into the United States through shipments of fruit. Now, unlike the wandering spider, this is not a nomadic hunter. It's waiting for its prey to come to its web. Now, let's say a fly or a beetle gets trapped in that sticky spider silk. What they will do is rush forward and inflict a bite. That initial hit from those fangs sends the prey into shock, and as the neurotoxic venom is beginning to shut down that victim's system, what the spider will do is crawl back and just watch its prey struggle. The more it struggles, the more it becomes entangled in the web. And once it succumbs to the venom, what they'll do is come in and spin a web around the victim and then store it there. Now, based on the variety of orb weaver, they have a different potency of venom. The one that's here in Central and South America, while I don't believe it can kill you, is extremely painful. A bite from the spider will cause your arm to swell up. It'll be really bad, you'll have dry mouth, cramping in your stomach, and uh, it's gonna be a really, really rough afternoon if I end up getting tagged by this creature. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, guys. Like the Black Widow, this spider is capable of giving me a pretty painful bite. But to prove to you that this spider is not just out to bite you, what I'm gonna do now is let it walk on my hands and my arm. Are you what? ready for this? Yeah. You're, you're gonna let that thing walk on you. This is to prove, oh my gosh, I just saw its fangs. Its fangs are huge. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm having second thoughts about this. <sighs> oh boy, here we go. What I want to do is actually use my spider stick and let the spider get onto the stick first so that it feels a little more comfortable. There we go. That's a big spider. Uh, you know what I'm going to have to deal with is the webbing, just like I did the Black Widow. Can you see that? And the tensile strength of this web is so much stronger than that of the Black Widow, so I hope that I'm not tangled up too bad. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna start by letting it crawl onto this hand. Oh boy, oh boy. Let me spin it for you like that. Wow, it is beautiful, that's for sure. All right, it seems to be pretty calmed down at this point. And what I'm gonna do is put the stick sideways. And my mouth is getting dry, I'm getting nervous here. I'm gonna just place my hand out in front of the spider and see it will walk out onto my fingers. Are you ready? One, two, three. Okay, the spider is on my arm. Okay, going up my arm. I'm losing control of it. It's getting back here. Let's see if I can get it out of my hand. Get around this way. There we go. It's got its legs up in the air. Let me see if I can keep it completely calm there. You can see my hand is shaking a little bit. Is that a defensive position? It's a little bit of a defensive position with the legs up in the air like that. It's right on my knuckle. Don't bite me, don't bite me, don't bite me. Oh, I can feel all the little hooks of its legs. What are, you, what are you feeling right now? I feel those nerves going? Extremely nervous. I'm trying to just be super still, let the spider find a place where it feels comfortable, and hopefully it will just, oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. It wanted to go right back onto the stick. Look, you can actually see the webbing hanging right from the tip of my finger. Here, let me see if I can get it back on my hand. 
here we go. She's really just interested in getting away. Now remember, this spider does have a neurotoxic venom, very similar to that of the Black Widow. I want to just remain completely calm. You were bitten by the spider, to be clear. It's a very bad situation. It could potentially be really bad, depending how much venom went into my body. Okay, oh man, the webbing is so much stronger than that of the Black Widow. Okay, where did she go? On your elbow, on your elbow, up your back. Okay, it's coming this way. I'm gonna slowly turn, see if I can get her back onto my hand. Yep, yep, there you go, got it. There we go. What I don't want to do is make any sudden movement or pull the webbing too tightly, because if she feels threatened, that is when she's going to bite. Now the way that most spider bites end up happening is somebody applies pressure to the arachnid and they fear for their lives. And a bite is oftentimes just a warning that, hey, I am here, don't squish me. Now spiders can control the amount of venom that they inject into what it is they're biting. And because I am not a potential prey item, if she were to bite me, oh boy, Right on the tip of my finger there, she's completely tangling me up. If she were to bite me, it could possibly be a dry bite or I would basically keep my fingers crossed and pray that it was not a full on bite loaded with venom because that could be an incredibly bad situation. There we go. She feels real comfortable there. Man, I am getting completely tangled up and I can feel how strong that spider silk is. Coyote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think you have good control over the situation here? I don't think you ever have good control when there is a spider just freely climbing around on your body. Where does she go? Okay. Wow, I'm getting big time tangled up here, guys. Look at that, there's so much webbing, she's able to just free climb right out on top of me there. That gives me the opportunity to get rid of some of that spider silk. Ooh, just a moment to breathe there where she's not actually on my hand. So tell us why you're doing this, Patty. Do you have a reason for this? There's always a reason for this. And the reason is that you should not just automatically be afraid of these spiders. Actually, these arachnids are doing wonderful things for the environment by eating a lot of pest insects. Now, if you're in Central or South America and you see one of these outside of your house, you don't need to be afraid of it. These spiders stick to their webs and all they're doing is catching nuisance insects. Now, if you go into that web and you try to harass the spider, obviously you may be bitten, but the spider really has no interest in actually biting me as long as I don't apply pressure to its body. I'm getting a little more comfortable now, but you always have to keep your guard up because you see how she's getting all tangled up in her own webbing? I don't want her to feel like she's getting pulled in any one direction and then end up inflicting a bite. This is a species that's only interested in eating insects, not in biting humans. Now, you would never do this with something like a wandering spider, correct? No, a wandering spider's venom is so incredibly potent, it could put me in the hospital. A bite from a spider like this, there is the chance that a lot of venom could go into my body. However, as a human, I am not prey for this species. So, the bite probably wouldn't be so bad that I need to go to the hospital. However, it would swell up, it would turn red, I'd have dry mouth, cramping in my stomach, but after about 24 hours, it would be nothing more than a red, itchy spot. You know, my nerves calm quite a bit once the spider has found a spot that it is comfortable and not walking around. And you can see its mandibles and fangs are, are well up off of my hand right now, but if I were to startle her or apply any pressure to the top of her body, it would force her down and that's when a bite would be inflicted. Again, I never recommend that you go out in the wild and ever try to freehandle a spider on your own. You never know how your body would react to the venom if you were bitten. Well guys, it looks like the sun is starting to get a little low in the sky, which means it's gonna be close to hunting time for this arachnid, because when the sun gets low, that's when all the insects come out. So what I wanna do now, ooh, she's going down my arm, is safely get her back up into her web so that she can go out and hunt for the night. All right, back up in the web with you. Spiders can be found on almost every continent. And while they're all technically venomous, they do their best to save that potent bite for their prey. Unless threatened or provoked, as a human, your odds of being bitten by a spider like the golden orb weaver are slim to none. So if you have the phobia of arachnids running chills down your spine, try to tell yourself that spiders are a good thing. And whether you believe it or not, 
spiders are actually our friends. The Costa Rican rainforest is considered to be one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Home to literally thousands of species, the crew and I have been fortunate enough to encounter some of its most iconic animals, from the striking red-eye leaf frog to the adorable ocelot. Now she has found the microphone. Oh. No, no. When exploring in Central America, one of our favorite places to visit is the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve, which is famous for having some incredibly rare and almost never seen creatures. Mark, Mark, come here! What is it? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! What do you got? You are not gonna believe this. Oh my gosh. And while I have been present for nearly all of these initial finds, every once in a while, Mark and Mario stumble upon an animal without me. And on this rainy evening, they just so happen to encounter what may be considered the rarest animal we have ever found in the rainforest. Mario! Max, yeah. Please, Come look what I found. What? What'd you get? I've got a giant ornithopra, the what? rare one. Oh, man. Right here on this rock. This is the one that's on the wall in the cabin. Yeah, that totally is. We, what do we do? Um, Coyote's not even here. What do we do? We just film it? Uh, well, certainly we have to film it. I've got a container in my backpack. Um, we could contain it, take it back to the lodge, have Coyote check it out, and uh, we get some great B-roll shots. All right, we have to, right? Yeah. We have to. We'll, oh, yeah. we'll bring it back. Yeah, we'll bring it right back after, and uh, that'll be awesome. Dude. Great find, dude. Wow. Okay, so. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Let's be gentle. Careful, careful. Be careful. You know, those things can spray stuff. Ooh. It was very velvety. Hold on, I gotta touch it. Let me see. Oh, it's so cool. All right, yeah? let's go. I'm so excited. All right, let's I, think do I, it. I can hardly stand still. Let's go. Secured. Yes. Woo. Peyote. Peyote. You guys find anything cool to photograph? Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Show. Check out what Mark found. Show. <gasps> Get out of here. We found you were kidding me! We found it on the rock, like four paces where we found the brown one. Yeah. Get out of here, I cannot believe that. Go inside and get the, get the picture, show everybody. So, oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> I cannot believe you guys found the Holy Grail! Oh my goodness, guys, they found <laughs> Good, ex good, good, you know, that, that's what we were looking for, <laughs> that it. reaction. Get out of town! We, we've been, we've been just like jumping for joy the whole way home. Look at it, yep, there it is. So we brought it back. Uh, what we want to do is we want to build a little film set. Ooh, that's a great idea. Oh, you know what we should do? Like a planet Earth type shoot where we set yes. it up on a little table. I've got the little table up here. We'll get some moss, get some logs, set it up and do a presentation. Absolutely. This will kind of be like the mole cricket episode only with a much rarer animal. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you found it. Holy GoPro, this is insane. So wait, who found it? You found it? Yeah, I, I mean, we, dude, yeah. we just filmed the people. Yeah. Woo! This is crazy! Not a bad gig, Coyote, when you can do your job and wear sandals. I do. I got my sandals on. I don't even have my snake boots. I mean, I was working on the orca script and uh, just kind of lounging. I saw the rain start to come down. I was like, man, these guys better hurry back before those cameras get soaked. Let me see if I can get it to just stay totally calm on my hand. Whoa, you are looking at the velvet worm quite possibly the rarest creature you can come across in the Costa Rican rainforest. This creature's ancestors date back 500 million years to the Cambrian period. That is before the time of the dinosaurs. Now this was one of the first terrestrial creatures to ever walk this planet. And even to this day, they are strictly terrestrial, which means that they stay on land. Now let's talk about where this animal gets its name from the velvet worm. Believe it or not, this creature feels just like velvet. Now, it does not have any hard outer exoskeleton like an arthropod, but in fact has a very soft, squishy body. Almost feels like a gummy worm. But if you pet it very gently, go ahead, Mark, put your hand out there, tell everybody at home, feels just like velvet. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, so like, like soft. a crush to all the suit. So soft. That is so cool. Here's something really cool. They are actually capable of shedding the outer layer of skin around once a month, just like a snake. And when they do shed that, they basically walk out of the skin, similar to the way a snake slithers out of its skin, and then they're even softer and more brilliantly bright. Oh, it's so cool. Let's take a look at the anatomy of this animal. Now, it looks like a mix between a caterpillar, a worm, and a slug but onychophrin is actually its own phylum, right? And there are close to 200 of them worldwide. However, scientists don't even know how many truly exist because they are very rarely seen. This is a nocturnal creature, and the fact that, Mark, you and Mario just stumbled upon it tonight is why they're so hard to find, because oftentimes they're out on rainy nights when most people aren't out venturing around. Now, despite the fact that this creature is actually kind of cute, Believe it or not, it is a voracious predator. And the way that they hunt is they slowly move through the rainforest floor, forging amongst leaves and dead logs, and they'll use those two front sensory organs to kind of tap on their prey. And as soon as they sense something to eat, this is crazy. They have two glands on the side of their face that shoot out a sticky slime. It's like Spider-Man's webbing, right? And it is so incredibly strong that it can immediately pin the prey down. It actually shoots out in two streams and those streams will cross creating a net. So let's say it's a small beetle. It will go shoot out those two streams, tangle up the beetle, and then slowly walk up on top of it. And they have a little mouth up front. I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not, but inside that mouth is a single tooth that is like a razor blade. They insert that tooth into their victim and then they leak in saliva. That saliva is similar to the saliva of a giant water bug and it slowly breaks down the insides of their prey and they drink it up just like a milkshake. Are you afraid of being bit right now? No, its tooth is much too small to potentially bite me and they're not aggressive in any way whatsoever. It's not like a centipede or a water bug. This is something that is completely safe to handle. However, it's incredibly fragile. So as you can see, I'm trying to be just as careful as possible. I also don't want it to shoot me with that sticky slime because it's just like glue. Now, is it toxic, the slime? Does it, does it like poison you or what as, does it do? As far as I know, everything I've read, no. The slime is completely harmless so if it does get slime on me I'm gonna be absolutely fine now each one of those little stub feet has two little hooked claws they almost look like cat's claws and they use those to hold on to rigid surfaces when they're moving over like let's say a log or a dry branch however if they're walking on something moist and soft like moss those claws retract in and they have these little tiny soft pads on the ends of their feet. I can actually feel it gripping onto my hand and it doesn't hurt at all, but it feels really interesting because those legs on each side move in unison with one another. And just like a worm, and remember, this is not related to worm, but like a worm, it has a very soft body and it's the expanding and contraction of the muscles inside of its body that allow it to get longer if it needs to. So like, let's say it's moving through some crevices in a log, it can stretch its body out and get itself completely out of a sticky situation. Oh, hi there, buddy. I see you. And look at the strength of its body. It can completely extend itself out just like we've seen millipedes do in the past, searching for the next move to make. And there it goes right up on my fingers. Wow. Lucky night in the rainforest. Man, that thing is so cool. All right, well, you built a pretty awesome little set here, Coyote. Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for us to get this velvet worm down on the miniature set and start filming some epic B-roll. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's get the voiceover going and turn this into a Planet Earth episode. The red velvet worm is a creature that is almost never seen in the wild with human eyes. Their elusive nature and nocturnal lifestyle, combined with their tendency to exist in only remote areas of the rainforest, make encountering them nearly impossible. To our knowledge, we are one of the only teams to have ever captured video footage of this animal. So having this opportunity was truly a once in a lifetime. This lucky moment will now be held near the top of our greatest memories we as animal enthusiasts will forever carry with us. And we are incredibly proud that we have now been able to share this encounter with each and every one of you.
Right now, we are on location at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center, one of our favorite places to film in Central America. This location is actually home to a number of different unique plant species, many of which are not even native to Costa Rica. And I just came across a tree that I think you guys definitely want to check out. I posted a picture on Instagram recently of its fruit, saying, do you guys know what this is? And whether you do or don't, do you want me to eat it? They're super strange looking. I've never tried them. I figured we'd save it for a video. This right behind me here is the Salic Palm. And actually its scientific name, Salaka Zalaka, makes complete sense, I guess. Trent, I'm gonna hand this camera off to you and we're gonna take a closer look at this very unique tree. Now, like I said, they're not native to Costa Rica. These can be found on several islands in Indonesia, but the habitat here is absolutely perfect for these trees to thrive. This one is actually a female. There's a male here right behind us. And one thing that you may not know is that only the female trees actually have fruit. And the fruit is right there. I think we all know what those look like. Ripe figs, but they're not figs. They're actually more commonly known as snake fruit. And sometimes this tree is called the snake fruit palm. Now uh, you'll look at these leaves that all grow right down into the base of the tree. And the first thing you're going to notice as you reach in for one of these delicious round looking fruits is that these leaves are protected with these really long, sharp and rigid spines. This thing is booby trapped. If you want to come in and get a quick snack, you better be careful because if you slam your hand into that, trust me, it's going to be a very unpleasant afternoon. And when it comes to getting the fruit, I'm going to just use my knife here to gently cut one of these away. Now there's some small ones here. These ones I read are not going to be ripe. The bigger the fruit, the more likely the chances of it being ripe. So actually, there's one that's right off of the tree right there. I'm going to take another one of these big ones right from the back. All right, check those out. Big fuzzy fruits. And the reason these are called snake fruit is because the outer skin resembles the scales of a snake. And they also have these really sharp spiky hairs on them. Can you hear that? They're very, very sharp and it makes it very difficult to get into the fruit if you're an animal. However, if you're human and you have opposable thumbs, all you need to do is pop off a little tip just like that and you can begin to peel back that rigid spiky skin. And these actually kind of resemble mamanchinos. We've done a video on those in the past. I know a lot of you called out, no coyote, those are rambutan. Well, in Costa Rica guys, they call them mamanchinos. Skin comes off, and there is the fruit. It almost looks like cloves of garlic. Now, inside the fruit, there can be two or three pieces, and you can split it apart into two unique halves like that. And on the inside, there is an inedible seed, which means you don't want to eat that seed. Uh, but let's go ahead and give this a try. It's the first time I am ever tasting snake fruit. It doesn't really smell like anything. Maybe actually a little bit like a potato. Oh, kind of sweet, and then it gets really bitter. Wow, that is sharp. And the texture is kind of like something between a dehydrated apple and a piece of potato. That's really not bad, though. And the more you chew it, the juicier it gets. But what I'm finding is that as the juice squeezes out of it, the fruit actually kind of dries out your mouth. It's kind of it's really starchy. Kind of gross. But there's what the fruit's like chewed up. Kind of looks like a mushy paste of potato or dehydrated apple. And once you get down to the seed, all you gotta do is discard that and go on to the next fruit. Now, I probably wouldn't eat a ton of these in a row, but if you happen to find yourself out in the wild and you come across a snake fruit tree and you want a quick snack, as long as you can get past all these spiny booby traps, you're pretty good to get one of these fruits and enjoy a quick natural treat. Of all the things I've eaten on the Bray Wilderness channel, at the end, I usually end up puking. Definitely gonna be no throwing up after eating the snake fruit. This is quite delicious. Hmm, there you have it. Oh, I dropped it. 
a little wilderness snack here on the Bray Wilderness Channel. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this behind the scenes episode. Now it's time to go out and find some animals. Okay, it's a beautiful night in Costa Rica and I'm sitting next to one of the most iconic snake species in this country. That is an eyelash viper. Now we've worked with this species in the past. In fact, I found the yellow phase of this snake out in the wild several years ago. But this one here is actually an ambassador for its species that was born and raised in captivity. This snake specifically is used to help educate people about the snakes that live here in Central America and why you want to safely avoid them at all cost. Now this snake is not necessarily as toxic as something like a fertilance, which makes it the perfect subject matter for tonight. What you see here on the table are a pair of Hexarmor bite proof gloves. Supposedly, these can withstand the bite of a venomous snake. Now obviously I wouldn't try this with something as large as like a Western Diamondback, an Eastern Diamondback, or a Fertilance, but the Eyelash Viper has smaller fangs and I feel a little bit safer free handling that snake with these gloves. We'll get to that risky entertainment in just a few moments. But first what I wanna do is take an educational look at this incredible reptile. Now the eyelash viper is an arboreal species, which means they're primarily found up in trees. And as you see the snake right here, gently clutched on this branch, it almost looks as if it's a gargoyle, staying completely still. And this is usually exactly how you will see these snakes out in the wild, waiting in ambush. They are ambush predators, and all they need to do is hang from a tree branch and wait for something to come close. They primarily feast upon animals that are gonna be up in the treetops. Lizards, frogs, bats, even birds fall victim to snakes like this. And you see that position the snake's in right now? That S-curled shape, head pointing down, something gets close, it strikes out, and with those hinged fangs, injects a hemotoxic venom. Now what's unique about the eyelash vipers, as compared to many other pit viper species, is that when they bite, they actually lock on. When you think of something like a fertilance, it's gonna strike out, inflict a bite, let go, and then track its prey once it has succumbed to the venom. But with a snake like this that lives up in the trees, it needs to bite and hold on. If this guy bites a bat, and that bat falls out of the tree, the snake's gotta go all the way down to the ground to get it. So this snake wants to bite, hold on, and then it's got its chance for a meal. Now the name Eyelash Viper, where does that name come from? If you take a real close look at the face of this snake, you'll see two little modified scales growing just above the eyes. Sort of makes it look like horns, or in this case, a pair of eyelashes. Now scientists believe that these modified scales perhaps help them navigate through the arboreal environment, maybe pushing away plant matter or possibly to help keep them camouflaged. These snakes are incredibly good at keeping themselves hidden within the environment. Now, if you're to go out into the Costa Rican rainforest at night, the thing that's actually dangerous is that if somebody grabs onto a branch, let's say you're moving through the environment and you grip onto something, helping yourself navigate. If one of these snakes is in the tree, that's how you're accidentally bitten. These snakes are not necessarily going to ever be aggressive towards humans unless threatened. However, if you were to unfortunately be bitten, it is a hemotoxic venom, and that means medical emergency. Now, you guys clicked on this video because the thumbnail likely has this snake close to my hand. It's like, oh my gosh, is Coyote going to get bitten by a venomous snake tonight? I'm not attempting to provoke a bite from this snake. The reason that I'm going to try to handle this snake with bite-proof gloves is because it's a fragile species, right? A snake of this size is rather delicate. It's not something that you want to squeeze and hold on to. You don't want to pin its head. You don't want to have complete control of the snake. The idea is that if I can hold it gently with these gloves, it may be a tactic that we use in the future to handle small venomous snakes. Coral snakes, sidewinders, eyelash vipers, these are perfect subject matters for using these bite-proof gloves. I also have to be aware of how close this snake gets to my face. So keeping it out in front of me like this is extremely important. Remember, they've got a rather far reach and a snake like this can lunge forward nearly two thirds the length of its body. If I'm bitten in the face by a snake like this, it's going to be a very bad end to my day. Whew, it takes a little bit of nerves when you start thinking about handling a venomous snake. And while in the past I've interacted with many different venomous species, to actually be hands on with one without controlling its head is something that I have not attempted before. So if you're ready, it's time to free handle the eyelash viper. What I'm hoping is that I will be able to get it to just kind of come right out onto my hand. So you see that? The snake is backing its head up ever so slightly. Now that position right there, 
definitely could warrant a bite. But you'll notice this snake is not aggressive in any way whatsoever. It's sensing my hand. Now I see the tongue flicking out. It's investigating me saying, okay, this is something new in my environment, but it doesn't look like something that I would necessarily want to eat. So I'm going to gently see if I can bring it up. Oh, there we go. Let's see if I can get you to come out here onto my hand. There we go. There we go. Okay, this is going really well so far. Really, really well. There we go. And I just want to make sure that I'm not constraining the snake too, too much. There we go. Oh, I'm going to keep you right there. That's perfect. I'm very happy about that position. Now, if I just keep my hand like this, you see how it's causing the snake to balance itself into a curled position. That is absolutely perfect. Now, on camera, it's tough to tell exactly how close that snake is to my face. It probably looks closer than it really is, so I don't want any of you to think, Coyote, you've got that pit viper way too close to you. Trust me, guys, it would take a huge jump for it to be able to leap out and get me in the face at this point. It's also why I'm keeping my hand slightly here blocked, just in case something crazy happens. But if I turn it like this, you can really get a great look at that snake's profile. They are just so incredibly beautiful. And like all pit vipers, they have a heat-seeking pit, and this snake is capable of sensing all sorts of different heat registers. So if this snake spots something like a lizard, this snake is using its incredible eyesight to be able to identify animals that do not have warm blood. Notice the vertical pupil. That expands and contracts based on the amount of light in the environment, which helps them to see incredibly well at night. And for anybody that's afraid of snakes, the fear, which is called ophidiophobia, you can see that this is not something that is aggressive toward humans. You may be saying to yourselves, well, Coyote, you said that this snake was born and raised in captivity. Doesn't make a difference, guys. It's behaving the exact same way that one of these snakes would in the wild. If you're not swinging your hand in front of it, if you're not poking at it with a stick, if you're simply admiring it from a safe distance, it will be a great experience. That's probably also a great spot for me to give you guys that stereotypical warning where I say never go out into the environment and try to handle a snake. Now the people that use these Hex Armor gloves are typically professionals. Anything could happen here. I could be bitten. While I do trust the gloves, I would never want you guys to be in a position where you could accidentally receive a bite from a snake like this. Now, like I said earlier, the reason that I'm using these bite-proof gloves tonight is to test out whether or not free-handling smaller venomous snakes like this is a good tactic for us moving forward. So if I were to physically grab onto the snake or pin its head down with a snake hook or hold it with snake tongs, it puts a lot of stress on the animal. You can see how calm it's being right now. And this is an awesome way for us to be able to get these animals up close for the cameras without putting a lot of stress on them. I'm gonna try a little experiment here. What I'm gonna do is slowly move my hand in towards the snake's nose. Not to necessarily provoke a strike, but let's just see what the aggression level is as I move my hand in toward its face. Very slowly. Look at that. The snake just basically stays in gargoyle mode. Yep, I bopped you on the nose just a tiny bit there. You can see it's kind of curled its head back in a little bit of a strike pose, saying okay. You got close, let's not push it too much further than that, and I won't, but that's exactly what I wanted to try to determine. Is this snake feeling completely calm because it's not restrained? It has no reason to strike out and try to bite me. Wow, what a cool experiment this was tonight. Determining that using bite-proof gloves is a great way to interact with smaller venomous snakes. It's allowed me to stay calm, the snake has stayed calm, and we've gotten a really cool Central American species up close for the cameras. The one and only eyelash viper. That is a highly advanced entomology light trap. This is my good friend and world-renowned entomologist, Jim. Say hi, Jim. Hello, guys. Tonight, we are using their powers combined to draw in some of the most fascinating insects of Costa Rica with the goal of catching and then showcasing a handful of them tomorrow under the light of day. But before we get to that, Jim, tell us why is this technology so advanced? Yeah, totally. We have a really incredible light trap that we use three different types of light bulbs to interfere the navigation of the insects. So we have the UV, the white light, and the mercury vapor to attract 
thousands of insects that we have in this rainforest. Now, why is that light combination so important? What does it replicate? Yes, so insects use the stars and the moon to navigate inside of the rainforest. So now that we have really dark conditions, it's like the perfect time to really attract thousands of insects in this light trap. So we are intercepting their path, and with any luck, we're going to see some really cool insects. This is gonna take a lot of time though, arguably all night. So we're gonna sit back and enjoy the show to see what sort of creatures show up. With over 14 years of experience, Jim's field entomology research is unprecedented, as he humbly boasts the discovery of more than 30 new insect species. A true fanatic of creepy crawly things, he has dedicated his life to rainforest conservation. And as we are about to learn, it all begins with the bugs. All right, Jim, we are about two hours in since the lights turned on. There are easily over a thousand insects on the screen at this point. But when it comes to biodiversity in Costa Rica, do we know how many insect species there are in this country? Yeah, absolutely. So let me explain a little bit exactly the biodiversity that we have in this really small country in Central America. Costa Rica has almost 6% of the world's biodiversity, which is insane for a country of this size. Uh -huh. And we estimate that it's around a million species of everything, you know, plants, insects, mammals, birds, reptiles, and many things more. Really, a million species within Costa Rica? Yes, exactly. Okay. And 60% of that, over 60% of that, actually are insects. So we don't know an exact number, and that's probably because you guys are constantly discovering undescribed species. Totally. You know, what we know is at least 20% of what we have inside of, the, of Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. We really unknown, you know, the biodiversity of our country. So the insects that we're going to see tonight, 80% of them are still undescribed and are named for science. Really? So you're saying 80% of the bugs we might see tonight could be undescribed. So we could be totally. seeing new species that you've never totally, seen before. Totally. So here's an idea. You're an entomologist. You know your species. Some you may not know. So it may be suitable to put you up to the challenge to see how many of these you can actually identify. What I'd love to do is get you up next to the screen and say, all right, I'm gonna point at one and you tell me if you can identify it. Okay. And let's see how many you get right and how many you just don't know. Absolutely, I take the challenge. You're up for the challenge? Okay, let's see if, you, right. can, let's see if you can name some bugs. <laughs> We're gonna go big. What's that? This is one of the fruit feeding moths that we have inside of the rainforest. Ooh, how about <laughs> this one? That is Silophanes, a sphinx moth, really important pollinator. Ooh, what's that? This is basically a moth that is mimicking a really toxic group of beetles. So that is a moth? It's a moth that pretends to be a beetle. Jim, what's that? So basically, this belongs to a family that we call Cosidae or leopard moths. Another moth. Great. Another moth. All right, I'm gonna guess that that is not a moth. Jim, what's this? Yeah, people think this is a type of dragonfly, but actually it is not. It's one of the ant lions, and this is a predator of insects. Okay, I would have guessed wrong. I thought that was a dragonfly. Ah, uh, okay, let me look. Moth, moth, oh, here we go. What are those? Well, they are basically a really important group of pollinator beetles. Uh, ooh, what about this thing down here? Look at what I've got. Oh my gosh. Ah! It's a, <laughs> give me a new species, hold on a second. All right, all right, I know what this is. Cicada. Totally. Uh, okay, this one is bizarre looking. What in the world is that? <laughs> I love this group of insects. We call fulgorid, and they are really colorful. Let me show you. Oh, I need to be like really fast you because they jump. It, did you? No, 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 they're oh, okay. fine actually. But let me show you how what? cool. It's like a dalmatian under there. Yes, absolutely. All fulgorids are amazing here. Is that a moth? They are related with the cicadas, actually. Oh. I mean, related, closely related with the cicadas. Not a moth, imagine that. <laughs> okay, look at this. Is that a new species? It's so cool, right? And actually, we have two, two species of the same, the same genus. Oh my gosh, you're right, Can this you is see? like, yeah. Yes, they are so similar, but they are like, you know, different. The wind patterns are totally, totally different. And am I right, is that a moth? It's a moth. It's a moth. It's a moth. <laughs> I got one, okay. And what kind of moth? It belongs to the Erevide family too. Mm -hmm. So not a new species. It's not a new species. Looks like it could have been, but. Okay, so let's look at these right here. What are those? Well, you know, coyotes, sometimes we don't know what we have and it takes time to realize what it is. I don't know what it is. 
Uh, are you talking about this one or are you talking about that one? I think it both. <laughs> both of them? Yes, I do this know what they are. This looks like some sort of bat creature. I know, right? I'm assuming it's some sort of a moth, right? It is a moth. Both are moths. Both but, are moths. But that looks like a piece of a stick. Yeah, totally. Like a piece of wood, right? It's perfect camouflage. So you're saying you don't know what these two are. These could be nope. undescribed species. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, we need to collect those specimens and then to do the uh, dissection, to check the genitalia, to compare it with the closer species, to figure out which kind of family it is, and then if it's unknown, we can describe the species. Maybe this could be we'll the coyote. Just leave that for now. We'll just say these are pretty cool. <laughs> We're not gonna invade their privacy like that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what's that one? Oh, okay, this is a group that we call Arctide. So uh, I love this group of moths. They're trying to resemble, you know, really like dangerous species of wasp. And that is why, you know, this species looks like this. Sure, I understand. So, aposematic coloration, mimicking a wasp. Correct. I was really thinking I was pointing at a wasp. Yet again, it's a moth. <laughs> All right, well, I would say without question, Jim knows his bugs. And what I've learned is that if it's not a moth, it's probably a beetle. Now, Jim, for an amateur entomology fanatic like myself, if I want to identify insects out in Costa Rica, is there a good field guide that you would recommend to everybody out there watching? Well, we have almost 11 years developing one app. So, you have an app for this? Yes, exactly. So we are one of the authors, and Biosur has been putting so much effort to put all this information in the pockets of the people. We have Animals of Costa Rica app, so we have mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, insects, and many things more you know, in this app. How many species have you guys cataloged so far? 7,000. So oh, oh my gosh! What? Let me see. What? This is insane, coyote! Oh my, oh gosh. my gosh! Oh my gosh! What? Dude. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is insane. It's one of the largest beetles of beetle. our planet. Holy <laughs> cow, that is an enormous beetle! Okay, that's the biggest <laughs> thing we've seen the entire night. No, don't even show the audience yet <laughs> what that insane. is. Holy cow! Yes! Dude, all right, yes. that is going to be the yes. ultimate bug of the yes. night. This you're gonna absolutely have to see. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe the size of that thing. It's Holy insane! Holy cow! What kind of beetle is that? This is basically Megasoma lephas. Oh, Megasoma lephas! Beetle, the largest <laughs> beetle of our planet! I don't know what that means, but Please. it's awesome! Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to meet the elephant beetle. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Jim, I'm gonna let you do the honors. Let's bring the beetle out of the container. I'm gonna place my arm out in front of the lens. Man, my hand's even shaking a little bit. Here we go. Coyote Peterson is about to handle the elephant beetle. Are you ready? I am ready, go ahead. One of the most strong beetles of the planet in your hand? I am ready. All right. Ah. All right. Oh, <laughs> those really claws are now. sharp. <laughs> wow. That thing, it has serious weight to it. I have never held a beetle that heavy or that strong. Ow, 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 okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can just get it to calm down in one spot there. And it's so spiky, is the legs as well. Very spiky. Now, I know the first thing that anybody's going to notice out there watching is that dominant horn. Jim, what is the point of the horn on this animal? Yeah, totally. So this is a male, so basically just the males, they have that beautiful horn and they use that for combat between males in the forest canopy. So when they see another male around, and especially if there is a lady around, you know, they're going to start like fighting and creating a huge combat between each other until one of them drops down on the ground. Now, when it comes to something of this size, believe it or not, they're capable of flying, are they not? Yes, exactly. So these guys are not able to really take off and fly away just from the ground. So they need to climb up trees uh, to get in the forest canopy and from there they can jump and take off. So, because they are super heavy, this is the second heaviest insect in the planet. But What's bigger than this? The Hercules beetle. Wow. Maybe it's possible that the big tree behind our setup is what this would have dropped down from. Yeah, absolutely. So the light for sure attracted uh, this guy. But yeah, you can realize that it's uh, one of the most heavy insects in the planet. Okay, so I'm obviously taking the impact of these grappling hook-like claws and all the spines on the legs, but I know one question that the audience definitely wants answered. Is this creature capable of biting? Does it sting? And is it venomous or poisonous? No, at all. It's a harmless animal. Okay. Really, really friendly animal. Um, you know, so people normally, like, they feel afraid when they see these enormous creatures, you know, 
is inside of the rainforest or around the houses in rural areas in Costa Rica. But yeah, I mean, it's a really friendly creature, actually. Yeah, you know, it's very intimidating looking. I mean, they say don't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge an insect on its alien nature. This looks like something that would, you know, grapple onto you and just inflict a painful bite or a venomous sting. But like you said, completely harmless. So what threats does an animal like this and all insects for that matter face within the Costa Rican rainforest? Yeah, well Coyote, I feel really worried about the conservation of this group of animals because they are crucial for the functioning of our ecosystems. 40% of the biomass of insects are gone in less than 10 years in Costa Rica. And there are three really important problems that still we need to work to fix this. So we are facing, you know, the loosening of habitats that is around 60% of the threats of insects and also you know the using of pesticides in our crops which is creating a huge problem with this the biomass of insects and of course climate change okay so it breaks down into three categories essentially mechanical right. the destruction of environment chemical which is pesticides and pollution and then all inclusive with climate change itself Total. and what happens if let's say all the insects on our planet were to disappear, what then happens to humankind? Yeah, we disappear with them. So people do not realize that we depend on insects. So all the insects are the most important creatures. We cannot imagine birds without insects. We can imagine that we're going to get food in our table without insects neither. People are oftentimes afraid of insects because they're misunderstood. And what we're realizing in talking with you, Jim, and working with your team and filming this episode is the insects need conservation. We're worried about things like polar bears and rhinos and all of these megafauna species. While that conservation is certainly important, these creatures need our support as well. And you're doing something very interesting in the Osa Peninsula with your organization, Biosur. Tell us a little bit about the focus and the goal for what you have going there. Yes, so one of the major goals that we have right now is to keep protecting you know, the tropical rainforest. Still, there are many areas that are for sale that are, you know, um, you know, unprotected. And that is what we're trying to do, to protect the habitats of really endangered species that keeps disappearing in our planet. You know, it's crucial. And I think it's, you know, to save the rainforest would be one of the best solutions against climate change. Jim, thank you so much thank for you, having Gignote. us as a part of your research on this trip. You're amazing. Uh, we're gonna release this beetle back out into the wild tonight, so we'll show you guys some of those shots. But Jim, this has been fantastic. All right, can I challenge you something? You challenge me, I challenge you. Oh, you're gonna give me a challenge? Of course. What's the challenge? To put that animal in your face. <laughs> <laughs> on my face, wow, okay, well. Yeah, it's. I'm not one to turn down like a challenge. Thin, so you should try that. Okay, I have a feeling that everybody okay. out there watches like, yeah, Coyote, let's see what happens when you place that on your face. Man, I'm kind of okay. actually worried a little bit about my eyeballs, but okay, right. here we go. All right. I'll put it on, the, try on that. the side of my head. Okay. I'm closing my eye, though, for this one. <laughs> All right, ready? Here we go. Okay, one, one two, two, three. three. Uh, oh, no, ah! the nails. Ah! <laughs> you can see how much ah! strong it is. Oh, it's in my ear. Oh, no. <laughs> ah! Oh, wow, they're really, really sharp. <laughs> okay, I think we can get the beetle off now. Okay, okay, okay. Protect right. my eyes. Oh, no, 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 no. <sighs> well, there you have it, guys. The Ouch. ultimate Ouch. bug amphitheater. During my time spent working alongside Jim, I garnered a new understanding for the importance of insects. To put it simply, without these alien-looking creatures, many of us consider creepy, there would be no us. Insects are pollinators, and without them, the plants from which we rely so heavily as a food source for survival would disappear. And if the plants vanish, it's just a few measly years before the human species as we know it ceases to exist. It's a harrowing reality whether you want to believe it or not. And the only way to slow, or maybe even stop it, begins with preserving the rainforest. The Biosur Foundation aims to do just that, but they need your help. As a nonprofit, they promote rainforest conservation, scientific research, and environmental education. The future of our rainforests relies upon the unity of our efforts. And if you would like to get involved, learn more, or even make a donation, please make sure to check out their site and follow them on social media for weekly updates. So check this out, we've got our first frog of the night, just a little one. I believe it is a stream frog. Let's see if I can catch it. You see it right there in the leaves, look how well camouflaged that tiny hopper is. Got it. 
that is a stream frog, a female stream frog. And the females with this species get significantly bigger than the males. Typically it's the males that are found in the streams, but females are more commonly found in forested areas. And one of the coolest things about this frog is the coloration on the underside of its belly. Look at all of that yellow and orangish red speckling, and then those bright red legs. And if you look at the design of the frog's head, it's almost matte in coloration. Not so vibrant on top, but the underside is absolutely beautiful. All right, let's let her go and carry on. Here we go. So it's not technically a frog yet, but right there is a little egg cluster of frog eggs. And inside, every once in a while, you can see the teeny tiny tadpoles moving within that gelatinous structure. That is some variety of tree frogs, and they are beginning to take on life. Very cool. All right, guys, we got another little frog here. Got him. Okay. Wow. That is a very strong, thick fingered dirt frog. Now, the females do grow larger than the males, so I'm thinking this is definitely a female. And what's unique about these frogs is that they go through what's called direct development. So these frogs actually lay eggs that turn right into little froglets. There are no tadpoles in the life cycle of this frog. No, I got him again. Wow, it is unbelievably strong. It's like on par in strength with the smoky jungle frog. And they call them thick fingered dirt frogs because look how big and robust those front fingers are. Very cool. Well, that is another frog to check off on our list in tonight's frog scavenger hunt. Not the most brilliantly colored one, but the life cycle certainly is interesting. All right, let's keep searching. I'm looking for frogs. You're scanning down, you're scanning up, and then back up, and then back down, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, got a frog right here. Look at this. Red-eyed, no! That is a splendid leaf frog right there. Holy cow, look at this. Yes! This is, without question, probably the most beautiful frog we could have come across tonight. Unbelievable. Okay, let's see. Don't want this guy to get away. If he's gonna go anywhere, he's gonna jump right out onto my hat. Got him. All right, let me see if we can get you to just, there we go, climb right up onto my hand. That is a frog that just jumped onto the light. Hold on a second. And I was just about to explain how like all frogs, they can hop if they need to, but they're much more prone to actually walking up and over the branches. You can see they have these really long spindly legs and each one of those toes is armed with a very sticky little suction cup pad. And in fact, their fingers can spread out so much that when they jump from leaf to leaf, they practically glide and can move themselves through the rainforest. When it comes to beauty, look at that orange coloration. And you can't miss that tiger striping that runs down the sides of the body. And look at those eyes. They have a vertical pupil, which gives them the ability to see incredibly well at night. And that pupil expands and contracts to allow light to come into the eyes. This frog is up in the treetops right now, hunting for primarily insects. This frog very rarely, if ever, comes down from the treetops. So for us to see one at this level, this height within the rainforest, was practically being in the right place at the right time. I'm just so blown away, so awestruck at the beauty of this frog. All right, well, we're gonna place this frog back up into its tree and see what other species we can find. I don't know that we're gonna find anything more beautiful than this, but we certainly could find something a little bit bigger. And there it goes, right back onto the light. <laughs> so, we've got another frog. I can't tell what species it is. Very difficult to see. I could just see its little butt hanging down on the underside of a leaf right there. And there's no telling whether or not this is solid ground or very sinky mud, but I'm gonna go out there and see if we can get that guy. 
What I'm gonna actually do is just pick the leaf and bring the leaf and the frog with me. Gives you a really good look at just how camouflaged these frogs can be. Legs all completely tucked in, eyes closed, just looks like a bump on a leaf. That is the red-eyed leaf frog. Quintessential Costa Rica right there. This is the most famous frog that you can come across here in Costa Rica. And even despite the fact that I've got him perched on the edge of my thumb there, the frog is still half asleep. And look at that. There's a little nictitating membrane that comes over the eye that even has camouflage on it. Looks like the veins of a leaf. This frog is an absolute master when it comes to camouflage. And one of the coolest things about these frogs is they are insectivores, which means they primarily feast on insects. And they have teeny tiny little teeth in those jaws, but they actually use their eyeballs to help push their food down and into their throat. So if they catch a fly or a beetle or a moth and begin to chomp on it, those eyes will help force that insect down their throat and eventually into the digestive tract. I put in quite a bit of effort to go out there in the mud to get you, but you're a little camera shy. That's okay, you still count as another frog in our frog scavenger hunt. The most famous frog we could have come across tonight, the one and only red-eyed leaf frog. All right, I'm gonna go back out into the mud, find a new leaf for this frog, and we're gonna continue searching. All right, got some good water here. Let's check this out. Oh, careful, slippery. Oh, here we go. Look at this, a glass frog. Yes! Okay, move very, very slowly right on the edge of that leaf. That right there is a dwarf glass frog. Now here in Costa Rica, there are 14 species of glass frog. All of them are very unique. Some of them actually have completely clear undersides. You can see the organs and the structure of their underbelly right through their skin. Now I don't need to physically get hands on with this frog, but what I will do is bend the leaf just forward for you a little bit there. Oh, now it's onto us. And what's really unique about the glass frog is that this frog's head structure is what actually gave inspiration for the design of Kermit the Frog. How cool is that? Kermit is, in fact, a glass frog. Well, of all the frog species we were gonna come across tonight, I was actually really hoping that we would see a glass frog. This is cool. The dwarf glass frog, smallest of the glass frog group. behind him. Got him! Got him! Holy mackerel! Look at the size of that smoky jungle frog. Those forearms are absolutely massive. Without question, a male. He is like Popeye. It's like this frog has been eating spinach Look at those forearms. They are so muscular. And that is the quintessential call of the smoky jungle frog. Now they will make that noise if they feel as if they're in danger. Am I gonna be eaten right now if I make this screaming noise? Perhaps whoever it is that's holding on to me will let me go and I'll be able to escape. Now, if the sound doesn't drive you off, these frogs secrete a very potent toxin from their skin. It smells very pungent, and if you have any scrapes or cuts on your fingers and it gets in there, it is going to burn like crazy. And actually, if that mucus is on your skin for too long, it will just start to burn on its own. It smells absolutely terrible. Now, the way I can tell this is a male, is the males grow larger than the females, and they have these very distinct secondary thumbs, which actually allows them to grip onto the females during breeding season. And the bigger and more dominant the forelimbs, the more powerful this frog is when it comes to battling for the rights to a breeding territory. I know, you've got so much to say. We heard you the first time. 
We really appreciate you hanging out with us tonight. Now, just so it's clear, me holding onto this frog right now is not causing it any pain. I'm holding onto the big, thick muscles in the hind legs. This distress call is essentially a way for this frog to escape any potential predator. You can imagine if you were an ocelot and you came into the environment and you bit onto this frog and it started screaming like that, it would startle you, giving this frog the chance to escape. But when it comes to frog scavenger hunts here in Costa Rica, I don't think we could have ended the night better than with the enormous smoky jungle frog. All right, let's get big boy back down into his burrow. Hey, Coyote Pack, if you enjoyed this frog scavenger hunt, write in the comments section below and tell us what your favorite species of the night was. Here's a quick recap. Streamside frog, thick fingered dirt frog, splendid leaf frog, red-eyed leaf frog, dwarf glass frog, and last but not least, smoky jungle frog. Far beneath the dense canopy of the Costa Rican rainforest, a plethora of toxic creatures hide amongst the foliage and shadows. From hopping poisonous frogs to slithering venomous snakes, these so-called biological landmines can frequently be encountered in almost any stretch of wilderness. Tonight, we are back exploring the 140-acre expanse of the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve, where the crew and I are on the search for one of Central America's most dangerous arachnids. However, before we could even begin to look for eight-legged creatures, we stumbled upon the rainforest's most infamous pit viper. Well, guys, one of the most common terms you hear me say is biological landmine. And we haven't been out for more than 15 minutes tonight, and already we've come across one of the most toxic snakes in all of Central America, the Fairlands. It's right there. And tonight's episode is all about these biological landmines, so it's just coincidence that we came across this small one right now. All right, Mark, just crouch down real slowly there. You can see it's right in the middle of the walking trail. I can barely is, see it. It is perfectly camouflaged. We almost stepped right on it. You can see it's staying completely still right now. And look at that camouflage. This speckled leaf-like patterning allows it to perfectly blend in to these leaves, and all of this dark mud. I'm not even sure, like I've got a shot of you and a shot of it. I'm not even sure people can see where it is. It's so camouflaged. Oh yeah, well actually that's a good thing. Why don't you just kind of give a general view of this area and let people try to pick it out on screen. Can you guys see the Fairlands? Is it there? No. Is it there? No. Oh. Uh, this is, this is the snake. Oh, careful Mark. Careful, careful, careful. Check that out. Uh, this snake is no stranger to us. We come across Fairlands almost every time we are out here in the rainforest of Costa Rica. And I would say this one's small to medium size. We certainly come across some that are much larger than this. And this snake is responsible for more deaths than any other species here in Central and South America. All right, let's let this snake go and see if we can find some of those creepy arachnids. All right, you ready? Encountering snakes is all about being in the right place at the right time. But when it comes to encountering creepy crawlies, these encounters usually happen when you least expect them. Oh, is this that cabin? Yeah. Jungle research hut. Ooh. There's some interesting looking spiders. That right there? Uh -huh. That's a fishing spider. Okay. That is a wandering spider. How do you know this? You can tell by the distinct stripe that's going right down the center of its back there. And so that's what we're looking for, just a little small. Yeah, it's a little small. We want something much bigger than that. All right, let's search all around the outside of this building. I feel that we're close. Oh, a scorpion. There's a scorpion back here in the thing. Huh. Yeah, there's a scorpion right back in there. You see it? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Let me see if I can, can get that one out. out. Yeah, let me see if I can. Oh, there it is. Then I'm gonna hold it. Here we go. It feels real comfortable on that leaf. Check that out. Yet another one of the Costa Rican rainforest's biological landmines. How dangerous is a scorpion? Mm, they vary. This appears to be some variety of bark scorpion based on its narrow front pinchers. 
but I do not know how potent the venom is, so I certainly do not want to be stung by any species that I cannot properly identify. Pretty good size one too, if it is a bark scorpion. Look at that stinger. Can you see it just in between my gloves there? Black tip stinger. Yeah. All right, let's place the scorpion back up on the side of this old shed and keep searching for the wandering spider. It was turning into a night of biological landmines. And while we came upon several different spider species, each one more creepy than the last, our target was yet to be located. So we continued into the night and headed toward a small jungle pond that was likely to have a world of creatures around it. Upon our arrival, all it took was scanning the overhanging tree limbs, and before we knew it, the rainforest's most dangerous eight-legged predator was in our sights. That one? Hold on, let me check. That's a big spider. Is it one? Oh boy, it, it's onto us. Look, look through there. Can you see the red underside to its legs? Can you bring the leaves down? Okay, I'm gonna back up. And it's really wedged in there. Okay. Let me see if I can see the spider in the leaf. Okay, let me let me see if I can grab it. You watch for the spider, right? Yeah. Okay, I got a leaf. There you go, go ahead, set down the leaf right there. <laughs> Let me see the capsule. Yeah. Okay, um, you guys got okay shots, right? Yep. You didn't see it run out of there when I grabbed the leaf. I did not. So there's webbing all over that. I think that's its permanent residence. So you probably don't want to destroy it. I see it. It's right in here. Which one? It's right in this leaf right here, this main okay, so stretch. Okay, what's the game plan here? I am going to put the end of the capsule right like this. Okay. And I'm going to gently try to coax it backwards into the container. Wait, where's the lid? Where's the lid? Okay. Okay. I have gloves, so you're on your own. Yep, everybody point. got a good shot? Yep. There it oh, goes. It's in there. It's in. Ooh, oh, no, yeah. it's not. Hold on. Nobody move. Look out, look out, look out. Back, 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 back. See how they jump? Got it. Ooh, that was a little nerve wracking. Wow. Talk about one fierce looking spider. Okay, let's back away from this watery area. What I'm gonna do is actually place the leaf back up in the tree so that we can just put the spider right back up into the tree, okay? Here we go. Oh man, my hand is shaking. Okay, where are you gonna do the scene at? I say we go down to the jungle research hut and get this spider up close for the cameras. It's the most controlled situation we could be in. That takes a lot of nerves. A lot of nerves, guys. Woo! Oh man, that was definitely one of the most nerve wracking catches of my entire career. I couldn't believe that when I tried to get it into the capsule and it sprang out, it came straight towards you guys. It's like a lightning bolt. Yeah, that is why we pay respect to the wandering spider. Let me take off my pack here and get a little bit more comfortable. I'm not gonna need the pack for this scene. I take off these gloves. Now I was wearing the gloves because I was afraid that if the spider leapt out of the tree, it may land on my hand and inflict one very very painful bite. Whew, here we go, guys. Now, we have been to Costa Rica many times, and this is bio landmine number one. You always see them hanging up in the trees, climbing up the trunks of the trees, running across the jungle floor. The wandering spider is quite possibly the most dangerous arachnid we could come across out here in the rainforest. Now, when I say wandering spider, that's a generalization for any spider species that's just crawling around out there on the rainforest floor, but there are actually eight cataloged species of Brazilian wandering spider, and I do believe that this is the Costa Rican variety. And the way that I can identify it as such is the quintessential red linings on the undersides of the legs. Let me tip it up and see if you can see that there, Mark. Look at those red legs. 
Now what this spider will do if it feels threatened by any potential predator is it will rear up like this on its back legs, revealing that red coloration. Now, aposomatic, right? Telling you that I am very venomous. Now if the red coloration doesn't warn you to walk away, you're gonna be bitten by two massive fangs that are armed with huge venom sacs. Wow. Yeah. And look at it looking at you. It's intimidating. I mean, it doesn't need to be scattering around inside of this container to know that it's extremely toxic. And you may be asking yourself, well, Coyote, are you gonna freehold this spider like you did the Black Widow? No way, guys. The bite from this is so much worse. Um, this is probably the only spider species that I've ever encountered thus far that really, really, really makes me nervous. Now you look at this, you're thinking, well, it's just kind of a big fuzzy spider. And I know some people have a horrible case of arachnophobia. And right now you're shaking in your seat thinking to yourselves, Coyote, how are you possibly holding this thing? But it is a creature that we do respect and we do love. And it is out here just doing its thing, hunting for bugs, hunting for small frogs. This spider is actually large enough where it can even take down some small mammals. That is one incredible predator right there. Sure that time that, uh we were in Osa Peninsula and you actually put your hand right by one? I do. I believe that was the eyelash viper video. And somebody actually wrote in the comments section on YouTube, it said, Coyote, you're aware that was a wandering spider, right? So we immediately looked it up and we were like, ooh, yeah. Only the most dangerous spider in the area. My hand was literally inches from it. And as you guys could see from earlier, they are capable of jumping. That's what makes them, in my opinion, so scary. Now they're primarily nocturnal. So during the day, they're hiding underneath old rotting boards, in between leaves, up in the canopy. And one way that people often come across these spiders is because they're constantly found in residential areas. During the day, they may even come into your house or hide in your boot, hide in your sheets. Anywhere that this spider can find a place to hide and stay out of the daylight is fair game. So you have to be extremely careful. That's why we always tell you, especially when you're in the rainforest, to check your boots before you put them on because overnight, a wandering spider could have crawled inside. And trust me, the one thing you don't want to happen is put your foot into your boot and you get a bite from this spider. Now, at full size, this spider can be about six inches in diameter. This one here is about four inches from the tip of its longest leg to the other tip of its longest leg. You hold it up for you like that. See that? Put my hand up next to it, kind of give you some reference. Whoa. That's a pretty big spider right there. Well, I would definitely say that it was one successful evening when it came to coming across many of the biological landmines that we see here in the Costa Rican rainforest. And nothing could have topped it off better than this enormous wandering spider. The crew and I have encountered many spider species over the course of our travels, some of which I have even been brave enough to handle, despite the risk of their toxic bite. However, when it comes to the wandering spider, there is no question about it. This is the most dangerous arachnid I have ever worked with. So if you find yourself in Central or South America and you stumble upon one of these large predatory arachnids, do your absolute best to stay a safe distance from this biological landmine, because its bite is without question something you never want to experience. Let me place it right back. Mission complete. I love frogs. Always have, always will. In fact, I don't think I have ever met a person that didn't love frogs. I mean, what's not to love? So when it comes to finding an incredibly high density of frog species, one of the best places you can visit are the rainforests of Central and South America. On this adventure, the Brave Wilderness team and I are back at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve, where once again, we will be working alongside world-renowned frog expert, Brian Kubicki. All right, guys, well, we just had an enormous rainstorm push through, which makes it the perfect time to head out into the rainforest and search for amphibians. Now we're looking for glass frogs tonight. We're not only gonna be looking, we're gonna be using our ears to see if we can hear them first before we spot them with our flashlights. So if you guys are ready, let's head into the darkness and see what we can find. Most species become active at night. So as we headed off into the darkness, it wasn't long before the sounds of frogs were all around us. 
Now, we had great rain that pushed through, so there's a lot of moisture out tonight, but I noticed so far, we've been searching along the edge of this stream. Is like flowing water the best place to search for glass frogs? Yeah, definitely glass frogs, they're associated with streams and rivers, so what we're gonna be doing tonight, we'll be walking along these smaller streams, looking in the vegetation growing on the banks. So we'll kind of, we'll be going along, listening for the calls, and then we'll look according to what the species calls from. Okay, well this looks like as good a place as any to get into the water, so you wanna lead the way, and we'll head upstream to start. All right, let's go guys, watch your footing coming through here. And of course, keep your eyes peeled for fair to lance. Glass frogs are Brian's specialty. So our goal was to find two species that we could compare side by side. And it wasn't long before we had the first frog of the night in our sights. Let's go ahead and get this one in a little bag here. Got one in my pocket here. We're just gonna use a simple collection bag. This is perfect for storing small amphibians temporarily. We'll bring it right back out onto its leaf tonight. I'll pull this down a little bit. You can maybe, uh, we might as well take its leaf too. Take its leaf, yeah. Oh, oh. oh jumped on here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just gonna put the... That shot on Mark, he's right there. You see him hanging off the back side of the leaf? Okay. There we go. Perfect, cool. Get him in the bag before he jumps again. Oh, 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 he's on my hand. Got him in the bag. Hold on, let me come up. See him in there? Yeah. It's on your finger. Oh, he's trying to get out. Other way, buddy, other way. There we go. Okay, cool. Oh, there he is. Let me see him come inside the bag. The dwarf glass frog is considered common, so it was almost guaranteed that we would come across this species. Awesome. Part one of two. Now we need to find one with a transparent ventral side. Stay down there, buddy. Okay, let's keep going. However, finding a glass frog with a transparent ventral side was going to be much more challenging, so we headed deeper to the rainforest. Brian's amphibian reserve spans over 120 acres of pristine rainforest. It's a labyrinth of disorienting confusion, but the good news for us was that Brian knew every step of it like the back of his hand. Eventually, we made our way up into a small feeder creek, the one place that he was confident that we would find the tiny treasure we had been searching for. Oh, we got right here, Mark. Ooh. Yes, yes, yes. Careful, Mark, it's slick back here. You guys, watch your footing, it's really narrow right here. Oh man, all right, here, Mark, let me get up to this spot. Okay. Here, Mario, can you see it? Yeah, I'm on it. We got him. Nice. That's a one. Oh man, that's so cool. That is the green stripe glass frog. So now we have the two frog species that we were looking for. Let's get them back in a controlled setting, get them on a piece of glass, and up close for the cameras. Yes, this is awesome. All right, guys, careful getting back out of here. Mario, man, yes. Right. With two distinctly different specimens in our possession, we safely made our way out of the rainforest and back to the jungle base camp. All right, guys, and we are back in a controlled setting. Now, this is the only good way to get an up-close look at the glass frog. And what I have right in front of me here, just coincidentally, is a piece of glass. Now, we have sanded down the edges so it isn't sharp and no one's gonna cut themselves. And what we're gonna do is actually place these little itty-bitty frogs on the back side of the glass so that we can get a good look at their bellies. All right, now, to get this piece of glass to stand upright, I actually have these clamps. And what we're gonna do is secure one gently on that side and another one right over here, like so. And then I have these last two so that it doesn't accidentally wobble and fall over. We're gonna place right up against that edge. There we go, you see that? Now that is locked in place. And we're gonna position this one right there. Cool, check that out. Now that looks perfect. Can you see through there? I sure can. Now I also have my SOG flashlight, my trusty SOG flashlight, the dark energy. And once we have a frog up on the backside here, I'll be able to do this. Light it up and you'll be able to see right through it. Cool. Now what I also have 
is this little container of water. And that's because I will be constantly keeping my fingers moist while manipulating the frogs tonight. And this water has been filtered. It is completely safe for the animals. Okay, you guys ready to bring out our stars? Let's see those frogs. All right, I got them right here. Two little Kermits coming in hot. Oh, perfect, look at that shot right there. See the undersides? There is the green stripe, and there is the dwarf. Now, we'll get the dwarf out first, and let's take a look at its top side before we go to the belly. Does that let's sound do good? Yeah. All right, now I am going to use this leaf and try to gently coax the frog out. Now, we have worked with some fragile animals before, but nothing is more delicate than a glass frog. Okay, the dwarf one is right where we want it to be. Oh, on my finger. Okay. 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 So you got an okay shot there? Sure. Let's see if I can just get it to hop right up on the glass. Go for it. Perfect, look at that. Like a little sticky green booger. So cool. So tiny too. Look, I will put my thumb right up next to the glass that frog is no bigger than the tip of my thumb. And you can see, go ahead and zoom in on it there, Mark. It's tough for me to see that side. Look at that green coloration. It's so vibrant, especially under the lights. Now they have, have a lot of personality. <laughs> oh, they really do. And you can see, oop, look at it, looking right towards you. They're very, very intelligent. You can see right now it's just looking for somewhere to jump next. I'm hoping it's gonna stay right on the glass for us. And you'll notice the skin is very shiny, right? It's very moist. And look at how big those eyes are. Now one very interesting thing about glass frogs is their eyes rest right on the front of their skull. Now this is a great chance for us to look at this frog's little tiny toes. And they do have a very minimal amount of webbing, especially between the front toes and the back toes. I can actually see the bones in the toes in the light here. That's crazy. And look how they can manipulate the position of their fingers. Look at that, you see how these left two here are turned to the side? And these frogs are not only excellent at jumping, but also at climbing. Here, let's do this real quick. Let's see what happens when I light this frog up. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. Point it up at it. There you go. Yep, that's great, right there. Cool. Here you go, buddy. Go this way. Now, Coyote, why are you using the forceps instead of your fingers? Well, those forceps definitely are not absorbing any moisture out of the frog's body. What I don't want to do because my hands are warm is, if I, whoa, all the way over the glass. Did you see that? That was a high jump right there. Oh, on my arm. Okay. Uh, the heat from my skin will actually draw some of the moisture from its body. So that's why I'm using the forceps to keep it in one spot. Okay, here we go. The, yeah, yeah, see the behind. We saw the, oh, oh. Yeah, here, watch okay. it. There. there we go. Perfect. All right. Now you can see that the upper half of its ventral side is not completely transparent. And the one that we're gonna get out in a second, you can see everything on the inside. But from the back here, I can see the heart beating. I can also see the bones in the legs. And you can see all the pigmentation of the skin. And it's a real great example of why they're named glass frogs. You can see how semi-translucent all the membrane is in this frog's body. And did you guys know this, that Kermit the Frog, the inspiration for the design of that very famous puppet, actually came from the glass frog. And you'll notice, let me see if I can do this. You see how each little toe looks like it has a suction cup on it? And there was a great little move there. You see how they just kind of hop and walk at the same time? And when they're up in the treetop canopy, they're moving around from leaf to leaf, hunting for Insects. Now they are little tiny carnivores. They're voracious predators and every single night once it gets dark, they're primarily nocturnal, they are hunting non-stop and a little creature like this can eat bug after bug after bug. So Coyote, we're going to be looking at two species of glass frogs tonight. Yes. How many are here in Costa Rica? 
Ah, great question. There are actually 14 described species of glass frog here in Costa Rica. Now, the two that we're looking at tonight are rather common, but there's a new one that was just described in 2015. And actually, Brian, who we were out with earlier tonight, he actually discovered that frog he's and the, named he's it. The one who, yeah, he classified He it. is cool. the glass frog expert. Well, that's why we were out with him tonight to find these two species. And I think at this point, let's get the dwarf glass frog back into the container and bring out the green stripes. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. Okay, now let me see if I can just get this guy to jump right up. Perfect. Mr. Venga is just jump right inside here. There we go. And. I'm pretty impressed by uh, the jumping ability of these little frogs. Ah, uh, it's crazy, right? Yeah, they, they can really move. There we go. Perfect. Well, I can already tell this one is uh, a lot more transverse. Well, yeah, and look at all of that beautiful speckling on its back. Now, they get the name Green Stripe because... Oh, Kermit, come back. Where is he? Right here. He's right here. Frisky little guy. There we go. Now, look at all the beautiful speckling on that frog's back. This one is so unique looking. And they get the name Green Stripe because if you look right down the center of its back, there's a very distinct green stripe. Now you'll notice the eye structure on this one is a little different. The eyes actually look a little smaller and the pupil is a little wider. Oh, let's bring you back over here. Frisky little frogs. I do have mine in there. It has a bunch of yellow spots all over it. Yeah, it does. That's really cool looking. And you'll notice that the toe structure is also very similar. And just like the dwarf glass frog, this is an arboreal species as well. I just really want to try to get it backed up in the center of the glass here. Okay. Okay. That's a great spot. Now it's got this entire glass to work its way up. And I love that, how they just keep their bodies slightly off of the leaf. And again, that ability to not only hop, but also hop and walk at the same time. Now, the green stripe is incredibly rare. This species was only rediscovered in 2004. And dating back to 1952, between 52 and 2004, there were only four of these that were found. Isn't that pretty crazy? This is a very, very rare amphibian for us to be looking at tonight. And he's back down on the table. Let's go back up on the glass. There you go. Uh, the only way that we were able to locate one of these frogs was being out there tonight with Brian and his expertise for not only being able to hear these frogs, but then also being able to spot them in the wild is unlike anything. He is truly the glass frog expert. All right, now the top side is very impressive. The speckling and the green stripe and those big eyes. But I know what you guys are waiting for is to see the ventral side where we can actually see those internal working organs. Oh, yeah. Should we bring it around? I've been waiting to get this shot for years. All right, let me delicately get it back onto this leaf. There we go. That's good. And get ready for it. Here comes the jump and the reveal. Look at that. You can see right through the underside of that amphibian. All right, let me. Oh no, you need it. Oh, where are you going? That's a cool shot. It's really cool. Hold on, I'm gonna bring it back down here. I don't want it to jump off and onto your camera. Okay, I'm gonna get back down here. I'm gonna actually give it a little dip of water here. Since we've got it off the glass, there you go, buddy. All right, here we go. Here comes the hop. Oh, they're so incredibly lightweight. Oh, there's a great shot of the leg there. Oh, and tucked it back in. You see when I get the light right up to the leg, you can see right through it. You can see the skeletal structure. You can see the insides. Oh, that's so cool. Coyote, I gotta tell you what I'm seeing here. I'm actually looking at the heart filling and pumping blood. You can actually see the blood moving in and out of the heart. That is so cool. You can see some of the arteries through there, can't you? Oh yeah. Can you see on the back side of the leg? I can yeah. kind of see some through on, on this you, side. You can see the whole digestive system. You can see all the vascular system. You can see it all. You can see everything. I would say out of any of the amphibians we have ever filmed, this has got to be the coolest. Look at that. Right there is the most quintessential textbook shot you can get of a glass frog. 
Man, I've been waiting to shoot this for so long. This is so cool. Well, we have been to Costa Rica many times and now we finally have the opportunity to work with a glass frog that has a completely transparent ventral side. Now this one here is a male and what's really interesting about this species is that the males actually take care of and look after the eggs. Now they oftentimes will lay their egg masses on low hanging leaves near flowing water. And when those eggs hatch, the tadpoles drop down into the water and that cycle will repeat. Now let's look at the size of this frog. I'm gonna hold my thumb up right there. It is no bigger than a thumb. And this frog is full grown. Now the largest glass frog species here in Costa Rica only grows to be about three centimeters in length. But there is one in South America that grows quite a bit larger if 8.4 centimeters is larger. I mean, it's certainly nothing like the smoky jungle frogs that we've come across here or the bullfrogs that we've seen in the States. But doesn't matter. Size is not everything when it comes to being adorable because this frog is absolutely the cutest amphibian I think I have ever seen. Wow, this was so cool. Well, it's taken us several trips to Costa Rica, but we finally managed to get the tiny glass frog up close for the cameras. Working with amphibians is a difficult balance, as these fragile creatures must always be handled with incredible care to ensure their well being. Under Brian's guidance and expertise, we managed to not only get the images we needed, but also safely release the frogs back into the same locations where we had found them. If you would like the chance to see some of these amazing rainforest animals in the wild, make sure to visit the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve's website to book your adventure today. The rainforests of Costa Rica boast being an incredibly diverse ecosystem with literally thousands of plant and animal species. And while many of these creatures are nocturnal and rely on the darkness of night to help keep them hidden, there are also plenty of diurnal or daytime animals that one can encounter. Today we're exploring the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve. Located in the Central Caribbean zone, its 121 acre expanse is home to over 50 species of amphibians, including the iconic green and black poison frog. My goal was to find, safely catch, and get one of these rainforest gems up close for the cameras. <sighs> no! Oh, they're so fast! However, catching a poison frog is far easier said than done. Just saw one. Did it hop away? Yep, it's right in these leaves. Hold on. Did you get it? Sure did. No, I did not. Are you serious? Anything? Ah. Uh, did it go in the burrow? I don't know where it went. Oh, jeez. Ah! ah! What is it? Stinging ants. Ah! Little fire ants. Ah! One of the dangers of catching poison frogs is you just throw your hands into everything, and I just threw my hands into a mound of fire ants. <sighs> oh gosh, this is uh, it's more difficult than I thought it was gonna be. All right, come on. Not only are these amphibians small and speedy, they are also incredibly aware of their surroundings. Ooh, there's one on that leaf. So at any sign of danger, Aww. they immediately flee into their burrows. This is a bromeliad plant and you see how thick the middle of it is. I'm just gonna bend this leaf down a little bit, take a little glance in there. You see all that water? That pocket of water is exactly what the female frogs are looking for to lay her eggs. Oh, there's a poison frog right there. Where, where, where? There's two, there's a red, and then there, oh, the red one's just tucked behind the leaf, but there's a little oh, green one. Oh, oh, that's a baby one. Oh, it's a, it's a froglet. We're definitely looking for something that is way bigger than that. Now the adults are hanging out by the plants too, right? Yeah, they can be. You can obviously also find them around on the forest floor, hiding in leaf litter or up underneath root structures. Like all of this area like this, just a matter of kind of trekking through it and getting lucky actually spotting one. All right, I'm heading into here. As we travel deeper into the rainforest, the wet and rocky terrain only became more difficult to navigate. And the ever looming cloud layer overhead threatened a torrential downpour at any moment, but I was determined to catch one of these frogs. <sighs> okay, well, so far, 
I have missed catching a lot of these poison frogs. We've seen them, and as soon as you see one, they disappear to their burrows. We've been out here for, I don't know, what you say, close to three and a half, four hours now? Yeah, I know. I think the rains are gonna start rolling in soon. I did not anticipate it taking this long to get a little green and black frog in front of the cameras, but uh, we are not giving up. We're definitely seeing them. It's just a matter of coyote actually catching one. All right, let's keep moving. There's a frog. You got one? Yep. Where, where? Oh. Ah, went right up underneath those roots. You see that? Where'd it go? Right there, you see? Okay, so there's this rock here. Mm -hmm. Look behind it. Yep. See those roots and those rocks? Yeah. Yeah, back up in there. Frog pretty much just disappears. Now, you may be thinking, well, Coyote, just stick your hand in there. Get the frog. There could be snakes in there. There could be spiders in there. I certainly don't want to disturb the animal's home. So, in all fairness, that frog evaded capture. And then finally, the combination of patience and a little persistence paid off. Did you hear that? Yeah, it's definitely a frog. Let me see if it calls again. No, your camera didn't get that sound, did it? You weren't rolling yet? No. Yeah, I definitely heard one. All right, I'm moving up this. It's definitely worth looking. This is a bit steep, but... Jeez, muddy. I see it. It is definitely... Is it catchable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, none of the rest of them have it. Hold on a second. I'm gonna have to die for it. Did yes! You get it? I got it! And a handful of grass, too. Woo! All right, I'm coming down. You ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes! Careful, careful, careful. Woo! You all right? Okay, yeah. Covered in mud, handful of leaf litter, but I definitely have the frog. Oh my gosh, are right, you ready? Yeah. This has been one difficult amphibian to come across. Ready? Oh, oh. Hey, don't move, don't move, don't move. I got it, I got it, I got it. There he is. Okay, hold on, just let it come down there. On a nice flat spot. It's gonna get away. Got it. <sighs> See how jumpy they are? Yeah. I literally am gonna have to hold on to this frog's leg the entire time. Let me, uh, let me wash off my hands in the stream here so I can get a good handle on it. Oh! Covered in mud again. My pockets are wedged full of mud. Totally worth it though, because now we have the green and black poison frog up close for the cameras. Oh, you are not going anywhere. Wow, well there it is, the black and green poison frog. They are so incredibly fast, and the reason I've had so much trouble is because they often hang out right in front of their burrows or in front of a root structure. So as soon as they feel vibrations in the ground, any sort of sounds, make visual contact, they say bloop, and disappear down into the ground. Now, aposomatic is the term that you always hear me saying when it comes to these brightly colored animals. And what aposomatic means is that it's a warning sign to any potential predator that I am toxic. If you eat me, if the stomach ache doesn't make you keel over, it may in fact actually kill you. Now, this variety is slightly more toxic than the granular or the strawberry poison frog, so I am definitely gonna be washing my hands after handling this frog. Now, when I climbed up the side of the hill, its back was actually toward me, which is the only reason that I think I was able to leap and grab a hold of the frog. But as you can see, as soon as I gave it any runway for getting an escape route, it immediately hopped off my hand and made a break for it. And the thing is, a lot of times we try to catch poison frogs, whether it's this variety or the strawberry poison frog or the granular poison frog, you think that you've got the frog, but they move so quickly, as soon as you grab down at it, because you have to be gentle, the frog is already gone. Now, this is a terrestrial species of frog, and you'll notice that it doesn't have webbing in between its toes. They're moving throughout the rainforest, searching the leaf litter for any small bugs they can come across. They're opportunistic feeders. But this species specifically loves to feast on ants, and it's actually the alkaloids in the ants that give this frog its toxicity. So, Coyote, why, why is this considered the most iconic poison frog? Well, just look at the coloration, I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. That green and black marbling is so incredibly distinct. And look how evenly it's spread throughout the frog's body. Now, I do have an admiration for these frogs, but if there's somebody that really loves these frogs, it's Mark. Oh, geez, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, calling you out. It's true, since I was eight years old, 
that's my favorite amphibian right there. Actually, I have a mouse pad of that exact frog. He does. I bet you're pretty excited. Once we get this episode through post-production, you get to edit the thumbnail, because Mark edits all the thumbnails for the YouTube channel, guys. You're gonna actually be scrolling your mouse pad over an image of this frog while editing an image of this frog. I know, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, <laughs> I'm excited about it. Very cool. All right, well, I am muddy, I am sweaty, and I'm exhausted, but we finally managed to get the green and black poison frog up close for the cameras. Over the years filming Brave Wilderness episodes, I have managed to encounter many species of frogs. And whether they were giant bullfrogs of the south, culturally iconic red-eyed leaf frogs, or tiny toxic jungle jelly beans, the green and black poison frog is certainly one that I will always remember as being well worth the epic adventure and incredible challenge to get up close for the cameras. What's going on, Coyote Pack? Right now, we are on the Caribbean side of Costa Rica, and for the past two weeks, we've been staying at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center Reserve. Just across this bridge right here is the rainforest, and every single night, we've been out there looking for animals. Now, the one thing I love to do when I'm on location is to take an entire evening to see how many animals we can get in front of the camera. So we've got Mark there right behind the lens. What's up, guys? Got Mario over here. Hey, guys. There he is. And, of course, the rest of the crew right there behind the scenes. Now, it did rain today, so I must add Ugh. that it's going to be pretty muddy. Yikes. But if you guys are ready, let's head out there and find some creatures. What do you say, Mario? Let's do it, right? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Here we go. Off into the rain for us. Good news is I already hear frogs, so we're going to find something. You really have to take your time when you're searching the rainforest because everything is so incredibly camouflaged. There's nothing there. You move slow because you also have to watch out for venomous snakes everywhere that you step. Oh, here we go. There's our first animal. All right, Mark. What do you got? I'm gonna lower my flashlight. Just kind of frame your shot in this general area and tell me if you can see what I just saw. Mm. See if the audience can well, recognize it. I can't see it. any eye shine if I don't. Oh, I see it. Yep. There it is. You know what that is? That is a walking stick, right? You're absolutely right. Let me just grab onto it here. Oh, come here, buddy. Oh, awesome. These are usually pretty difficult to see because look at it. it looks just like a stick or a piece of straw. That is awesome. Do those things bite? Uh, they do not, which is good news for me. I'm watch this, I'm gonna let it walk on my face. It's one of the few creatures that I'm completely comfortable letting do this. Ah, am I poking your eye? Ah. <laughs> now the reason that I did that is to show you guys just how good they can climb, and look at that. They're actually capable of hanging upside down. They have these little hooks on the bottoms of their feet, which allow them to be completely mobile no matter where they are climbing. Okay, I'm gonna try to bring it back down, put them on the tree, Oh, come here, buddy. Let's try to find something a little more dangerous than the walking stick. Very cool first animal, though. Definitely watch where you're walking, Mark. Yeah, I'm Could trying to keep an eye out. It's crazy. In the two weeks we've been here, we have seen so many snakes. It's like you just step and you're like, whoa, there's a snake curled up right there. Now, would a fair lance be below the water, or do they stay on the surface? No, nope, they would be staying right up on top, but they would be curled up in a ball and almost impossible to see. Come on, come on, come on. Got it. Where is he? Right there, coming to the surface. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got it! Yes! <laughs> Woo! Nice snag. Ah, the one-handed grab! My favorite way to catch mud turtles. All right, let's uh, trek it back this way and get up on in the embankment. Okay, okay come on. Cool. Yes! Woo, look at you! Snapping at me. That is a white-lipped mud turtle, and they can be pretty aggressive. Let's see what that bite is like. Ooh, I don't know, should I do it? I don't know, what do you think? Is it gonna hurt? I think it's probably gonna hurt, let's see. Ah, yeah, that hurts. Look at that, the ooh, just like the neck of a snapping turtle. Look at that, oh, it didn't break skin. Thank you, I appreciate that. The eyes almost look like the eyes of a snapping turtle, and then they have that masked structure right on the sides of the cheeks, and that very distinct white nose and beak. Well, cool, second animal of the night, and you guys know I can never resist catching turtles. Ready to put them back? Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Come 
there's a monstrous tarantula that lives right in the crux of that tree. I think I can kind of put this in front of the tarantula and get it to pop up out of the hole and then maybe grab a hold of it. All right, man, good luck. Wow, it's so quick. There's just no good way. All right, let's go, guys. Whoa, whoa, right here. Look at this guy. Oh, yeah. It's huge. Whoa. What is that? A hey, tarantula. That is a huge tarantula. Okay, well, we go after one tarantula. It's actually smaller than this. This looks like it's a male. Boy, I'm tempted to try to pick it up, but I'm not 100% sure what species this is. Now, I know my spiders that are in Arizona, but the ones here in the rainforest of Costa Rica, it's like, I just don't know if it's worth risk trying to handle it. It is very, very flighty. Uh, I'm gonna try to just pin it, ready? This is risky. Oh! Oh, I got Mark! It's on your oh, leg. Mark, it's on don't you. move, don't move, don't move. Oh, jeez. It's on you, man. <laughs> don't move, don't move. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. It's very strong. Okay, you got it. There we go. Okay. Boy. Oh, okay. Now we got it under control. That's a big spider. Now, I am gonna go ahead and set it down on my hand. Oh, just jumped right off of me. Okay, <laughs> has no interest in just hanging out, but there it is, back on the floor of the forest. Well, if there's anything that can possibly give you a nightmare out here in this rainforest, it's definitely a giant fuzzy tarantula. All right, let's keep moving and see what else we can find. A lot of vine tangles. Ooh, no, it looks like something. Oh, here we go, what's this? Oh, you got a snake. Yeah. That is a blunt-headed snake. Look at that, just all curled up in the vine. Oh, look at its eyes. Is that venomous? Uh, mildly venomous, but rear fanged, and they are not prone to biting. So, keep my fingers crossed on this one. Wait till you see how long and slender this snake is. And they oftentimes do musk as a secondary defense. Woo, look at that. Whoa, man, that it's is a long down here. snake. Wow, look at that snake. Oh no, it is, it's musking all over me. Uh, oh no, I knew it was gonna happen. I was trying to be as gentle as possible. The most interesting aspect, look at those eyes, enormous eyes. Its head is mostly eyeballs. Now, this is a nocturnal and an arboreal species, which means that they're out in the trees at night hunting for their prey. Now they special. <laughs> Oh, geez. oh man. Dude. You rolling? rolling? Yeah, I'm rolling. Man. Well, there is nothing more dangerous than that moment right there. Now, there is no question about it. I just had my butt inches away from that fair lance. Whoa. Why don't you hold on to that for us? Mario, wildlife biologist, can wrangle that. I am going to gently move this fair lance out of the way, okay? Sure. Look at that. The snake doesn't want to strike unless it is threatened, so it felt as long as I stayed there and I was perfectly camouflaged, maybe nobody would notice me, and we just keep our focus on that blunt-headed snake. <sighs> Thank you, little fair lance, for not tagging me because even a fair lance of this size would send me to the hospital. Okay, I'm gonna place him over here in the leaves. Okay. Set him down, let him take off, ready? There you go. Ah. Every once in a while, you just say thank you to the universe for letting you escape completely unscathed when you get that close to a very dangerous snake. Wow, okay. Back to the blunt-headed snake. Woo! That was a close one. All right, Mario, let's bring that snake back in and continue this intense snake segment. Now, I was saying, look at those eyes. They are so enormous. This snake's head is all eyeballs. That's because they're out here hunting at night. This gives them good vision. Now, what they focus on is small lizards. So, let's say it's an anole or a gecko. This snake will sneak up on it. You can see how it can stay completely still. Look at that, it looks just like a vine. So if a little gecko is wandering around on a leaf, right there, and then the snake 
strikes out and is able to consume it. Very, very cool. Well, we've got a snake that is relatively safe and then a snake that was incredibly dangerous right next to me. Pretty good opportunity to give you guys a good look at some of the reptiles that are here in the rainforest. All right, let's put this one back into the tree and watch our step where we're going. Definitely looking here, it's a good spot for insects and arachnids. Here, let me get across here. Oh, there's a scorpion right there. Look Where? at that. Oh, geez. Oh, wow. That's a good size one for rainforest. Size, yeah. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pin it with my flashlight. You got a shot on it? I wanna be as gentle as possible. This isn't gonna hurt the scorpion in any way. It's probably gonna get pretty angry though. Okay, I'm ready. Here we go. Nice got it. Woo! <laughs> I do believe this is the Blue Mountain Scorpion, a rather rare species that is pretty newly discovered. I wonder what would happen if I let go of its tail. You think it would sting me? Uh, no, I, I doubt it. Okay, there you go. You can see the stinger is completely curled up underneath the tail. Wow. Get your heart racing a little bit when you let the stinger go like that? A little bit. It's been an on edge sort of night after that fair to lance encounter and now to free handle a scorpion. But always cool to come across any sort of creepy crawly out here. All right, let's let him back up onto these boards and see what else we can come across. You ready? Yep. Oh boy. Oh boy. Nope, 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 nope. Let's do this. Oh no. Do not want to agitate the scorpion. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, scorpion safe down into that crevice. Tell you what, free handling one of those arachnids definitely gets your heart rate going. Okay, let's keep them going, guys. Guys, let's move up this way. Okay. Whoa, whoa. We got, we got a venomous snake, Coyote. Oh. What? Yep. Where? Right here. Watch your steps. Just walk right past Is that there. A bush mask? It's really camouflaged. Ooh, is it another fair lance? No, no, it's actually a jumping pit viper. Cool. Oh my gosh. Look at that pattern. How did I miss that? I literally just walked right over the top of this log and I looked down where I was stepping, but I did not look to the side. All right, let's get it off the log. This is definitely one worth getting up close for the cameras. They call them jumping pit vipers because they will lunge out. Gently pick it up with the snake up here. They tend to stay pretty docile. Look at that robust body. Okay, back it up slowly here. All right, I got okay. the snake under control here. I'm gonna move down real slowly. Now, like a water moccasin, they will oftentimes just curl up into a ball and display their white mouths. Let's see, look at that. Totally calm. Very unlike the Ferdelance, which is a very skittish, snappy snake. I'm gonna get a little lower there. Still out of the strike zone, but I wanna be very careful. I'm looking this snake right in the eye, and I can tell it's a pit viper, not only from the shape of its head, but look at the distinct pits right behind the nostrils. Let's see if I can point that out. Look right there. That's how they sense heat, and not only their prey, but also potential predators. So right now this snake is thinking, ooh, got these big bright lights, got all these human bodies, way too big to consume, so I better just keep myself calm and collected. All right, Mark, I'm gonna hold it up just a little bit so you can get a better look at it. Now, the bite from this snake is very powerful. They're actually referred to as the pit bull of the pit viper family. And when they bite, they hold on, scrunch up their face to protect their eyes, and they do not let go. So getting tagged by this snake would be really, really bad for me. Pretty cool though, getting up close with the jumping pit viper. All right, back into the forest with this one. Come on, little buddy, back up on your log. Now, this is so cool. I just wanted to stop for a moment and show this to you guys. Look at this, there is water just flowing through the forest right now. We have had so much rain over the past couple days. The forest is alive with frog sounds and snakes moving about hunting. But here, I'm gonna kinda turn like this, look up that pathway. This is just water flowing through the forest. And this is not a stream. No, this is not a stream. This is just a, a path through the middle of the forest that has water 
flowing through it, which is great for us to be able to find animals. So the environment is rich, and hopefully we're gonna come across some more great things. Let's keep going. There's a glass frog right there. Right there on that leaf. Is that what's making that peep? Yep. Well, I don't know if that one's making that exact peep, but that's a glass frog. Okay, they're pretty quick. Got him. Okay, cool. Yes, okay. Double check your snakes. I think we're good. There he is. Look at that little guy. Whoa, look at his eyes. You know who it looks like? Kermit the Frog. And actually, Kermit was designed off of this exact frog species. Now, they call them glass frogs because their bodies are semi-translucent, especially on the body. Actually, some species, I can't tell with this one. Let me hold them up here for you. No, that one has a white bottom. Has a white bottom? Okay, some of them have bellies that are completely clear and you can actually see the organs moving inside. That is one adorable frog. Now, up against the light like that, its body is semi-translucent. I can actually see some of the organs and veins in there pumping, working away, keeping this frog alive. All right, let's let him go. All right, let's do this. I'm gonna try to just let him hop right back up onto this leaf. Light, light, light. Got it. Oh, that's a coral snake. That is a coral Woo! snake. That's a very dangerous snake. Yeah, that is a very dangerous snake. Is it a coral? Yeah. That is 100% a coral snake. Do not want to be bitten by this snake. Now, this does not have hinged fangs like a pit viper. They have small fixed fangs, but they are extremely venomous. That's the biggest why coral don't, snake why I've don't ever I seen. Pin it, why don't I pin its head and get it under control? You sure you want to head that? Oh my goodness. The best way for us to present this snake because it was moving so much was for me to actually just head it and get it under control. That is an enormous coral snake, is it not? Yeah. Biggest yeah. one you've ever seen? Yep. They are incredibly fast, incredibly strong, and the venom is incredibly potent. Being bitten by the snake would be just as bad as being bitten by a ferret lance. I can't believe how many snakes are out here and on the move tonight. Unbelievable. Now. It is musking a little bit. It's, it was very scared when we came up on it. It moved very quickly and is able to just gently grab a hold of it with the snake tongs. And I have a good fixed hold on the head, gentle yet controlled, as you can see there. And it is just, wow, look at the iridescence to the scales. Can, can your camera pick that up? Yeah, it is a beautiful snake. That wow. is really impressive. Now, the bright coloration of this snake goes in line with the aposomatic term that I often use with the poison frogs. Anything that has bright coloration is a warning that I am toxic. And in this case, it's a venomous snake, not a poisonous frog. And again, a bite from this snake would send me to the hospital. Now most of the snakes that we have come across so far here in Costa Rica are pit vipers, but this one is an elapid. They're actually related to cobras with a very, very potent venom. Ah, <sighs> well it certainly has been the night of serpents between my close call at the fair lands and then of course that jumping pit viper and now the coral snake. I'll just be happy when we get this one back off into the rainforest. During the wet season, Costa Rica is famous for having endless days of torrential rain which makes filming episodes incredibly difficult. This is one of the most incredible fossorial creatures. Hey Coyote, I'm, I'm sorry to stop you man. The, the, the camera's getting doused. I'm afraid we're gonna lose the camera. Ah, uh, dude, we have to film this animal. I know. On one hand, this natural rainforest cycle presents challenges. However, it also creates the perfect conditions for finding reptiles and amphibians. While on the Caribbean coast, we spent several days exploring the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Preserve, and this expanse of mid-elevation rainforest is home to one of the richest populations of frog species on the planet. All right, we are rolling. Check that out. And you are in some mud. This is definitely a good sign. It has rained quite a bit here in the rainforest. Now, recently we just showed you guys an episode with the red-eyed leaf frog, probably the most famous amphibian species here in Costa Rica. And while we were out at night, we kept seeing these larger tree frogs. They're green, they also have red eyes, and they're actually called gliding tree frogs. And I figured you guys probably want to see those up close for the camera. So what we're going to do tonight is head over to this pond where they have come down from the trees, work our way through this gloppy mud, and get some up close for the camera. 
Typically, these frogs can only be found high up in the canopy. However, when large rainstorms push through, they descend from the treetops to begin breeding. And because of this, we were able to witness all stages of this creature's life cycle. From eggs, to tadpoles, and of course, plenty of adults. Get ready to meet the gliding tree frog. Let's see what we can find. Oh, there's a frog right there. Great place to look for creatures. There's a turtle. Look at that. See a turtle? I see a turtle. Think you can catch it? I'm going to most definitely catch it. All oh, right. I see it. Keep the lights on it. Got it. Nice. Woo! There we go. Oh, yeah, that's a little deep right there. there. Check that out. Wow. Well, we've seen me jump into the water and catch turtles before, but not for this species. That is a white-lipped mud turtle. Not musking on me, though they are capable of musking, like most uh, musk and mud turtles. Look at that. Sharp front claws, too. And the bite of this turtle is, ooh, yeah, pretty powerful. You see how long they can extend their neck out. I see you. Yes, no, my finger is not a tadpole. This turtle is definitely too small to be eating any large frogs, the ones that we would be looking for. But tadpoles and little froglets are definitely fair game. So we're going to put him back into the pond and see if we can find ourselves some frogs. There he goes. Bye, buddy. Whoop. Oh, they bury quick. OK. Oh, look at this. Ha! Perfect. Right on the edge of the pond, exactly. Wow, OK, there's a snake right there next to us with a mouthful of eggs. That is a cat-eyed snake. Wow, it does have an egg hanging out of its mouth. OK, caught this guy right in the middle of dinner. I'm going to take my flashlight off it, OK? Yeah. So you see it well enough? Yeah, oh, this here. is perfect. I and mean, we are just two for two here. I'm going to gently bend this leaf around here for you, Mark. Look at this. You see that? Looks like fungus, right? Those are eggs. Those are eggs. Those are the eggs of the gliding tree frog. Now, this is one of the dangers of being a frog and why these frogs come down in the masses to lay their eggs because there's so many predators. These eggs aren't even going to get the chance to develop into tadpoles and then drop down into the water. Kind of sad, but that's part of the cycle out here in the rainforest. All right, sorry, buddy. We're going to disturb you during dinner. Let's see if I can just gently, oh, now you know this has been spotted. Oftentimes, they will musk. It's a very cool snake. There we go. I just want to be really gentle. Hopefully, with that mouthful of frog eggs, you will be thinking, I'm full. I'm not going to be biting anybody. Look at that. And these snakes have incredible balance. Look how it's capable of just completely extending out its head, almost like a vine. You see that? It's looking at your microphone right now, Mark, thinking, hmm, that looks like a place to escape to. You know you have some of your dinner on the side of your face. Are you aware of this? He's kind of like, you guys shouldn't have bugged me during here. Look at that. I can just feel how well this snake is capable of, watch this, it's going to try to get out onto the tree limb. It can completely hold up the weight of its body. Look at that. Wow. So incredibly strong. Look at how it just slinks up the side of that tree. That is amazing. Let's see. Can he actually hold on to that? He's going to curl his body around. Wow, how about that? Well, two predators right in a row. I'm going to let go of it. I feel like it doesn't even know that it has an egg hanging out of the side of its mouth. Can you see that? I can. Caught red-handed. Caught you, buddy. Robbing the nest of eggs. So cool. All right, what I'm going to do is actually put him right back where he was. Uh, I know that he is eating the eggs of the frogs, but that is a part of the life cycle of these reptiles and amphibians, and I do not want to disturb him from his dinner any more than we already have. Here you go. Okay, well, that's a pretty good start. We walked out of the jungle right here to the edge of this body of water and already have caught two of the predators that are out here helping to control the population of these frogs. But for us, we want to get up close with one of these amphibians, and this is the absolute perfect time to do it. Let's work our way along the edge of the pond and see if we can find some. Sound right. good? Yep, let's do it. All right. Come here. What do you see? What do you see? Look at this wandering spider. Whoa. That is an enormous spider. And if you walk underneath a branch like this and you bump it and that falls into your neckline and you take a bite, you are going to the hospital. Look at how big that thing is. All right, just again, guys, Mark, Mario, make sure you're paying attention everywhere that you are going. All right, let's keep going. 
Oh, there's a red-eyed tree frog right there. Check that out. <laughs> we spent so much time looking for a red-eyed leaf frog the other night, and sure enough, there's one right there. Let's do this. Actually, get it up close for the camera. Can't let you not have a starring moment, little guy. Look at that. Ah, isn't that awesome? Oh man, Cody, yeah. look to your left. Here we go, down. Perfect, look at that. That is a big tree frog. Oh, got it. There we have now. Oh, I hear you chirping. There is the gliding leaf frog right next to the red-eyed leaf frog. Wow, now you can see the distinct differences between the two, and you'll notice the differences in the eye color. You see that? The red-eyed leaf frog has a much more brilliant orange to its eye, and the gliding variety is darker brown and significantly bigger. Now, the most distinguishing feature is look at the side of this frog's body. You see how yellow it is? All uniform in color, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, the red-eyed leaf frog, can you see the color on the side of its body? Oh yeah, definitely blue with those iconic yellow stripes. And you'll notice that the red-eyed leaf frog has very orange toes. Oh, where are you going? Come here. Very orange toes and very yellow toes on the gliding leaf frog. And the size difference is really the big thing. So Coyote, I noticed that you're holding the male. How big are the female gliding frogs? Those are almost twice the size of the male, and that's what I really want to get up close for the camera. So let's keep searching, put these frogs back on their leaves, and hopefully we'll find one. You ready? Yep, let's put them back. All right. Whoop. Yeah. Got it right back here. Ready? Ah, there we go. Look at that one out there on that tree branch. That one looks like it's pretty good size, and it will pose a little bit of a challenge. Watch that branch, here we go. One, two, three. Yep, got away. I got the frog. Here. Nice grab. Oh, I'm stuck in the mud. Okay, back up a little bit. Yeah, Coming up there. Here. That is probably about average size for what we've seen tonight. Maybe a little bit bigger, but definitely the gliding tree frog. Look at that little creature. Wow, this is good, because now my hand is wet and it's keeping the frog moist. And look at how those sticky pads are just gripping onto my finger. Now let's talk about the name of this frog for a second, the gliding tree frog. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, they must glide through the rainforest. Now when they leap, they spread out their arms and their legs and then quap, land down on a leaf. It's speculative that they're actually gliding. It could just be the momentum of their body and the weight as they're hurling through the air that makes it appear as if they're gliding. Either way, this frog has definitely earned a very cool name. Compared to its body size, it's, its hands and its feet look quite large. Oh, they are, and it needs to have these large feet and hands because if it's sailing through the canopy from leaf to leaf, if it misses a leaf, let's say it just kind of goes off course, it only needs one hand to be able to grab on and then it will swing its body up underneath and be able to prevent itself from falling down to the forest floor. That's pretty cool to be out here in the rainforest where we're getting to see all phases of this frog's life tonight, from the eggs to the tadpoles to little froglets far out there in the water, and then of course the adults, which are just all along the edges of the pond. All right, let's let them hop back off into the wild. The Alturas Wildlife Sanctuary has a very clear mission when it comes to Costa Rica's wild animals that are in need of help. Rescue, rehabilitate, and ultimately release them back into their natural environment. But what about the animals who cannot make a full recovery? <laughs> Located in the coastal town of Dominical, Alturas also calls itself home to nearly 50 permanent residents. These animals cannot be released back into the wild because of disability or severe over-domestication. And while some of these permanent residents are covered in fur, it's sloth feeding time. Many are actually of the feathered kind. So this morning I will be sitting down for breakfast with one of their newest additions, a baby toucan. This is the real Fruit Loops right here. This is fresh cut fruit. And what I'm about to do is feed it to a baby toucan. It smells really good. This looks like something that I would eat for breakfast. So I have a feeling that this toucan is absolutely gonna love it. Oh boy, here he comes. Oh. Look at that! 
That is a baby toucan. I have never seen one of these before. That is so amazing. You look like a little dinosaur. Look at that curious head. Look what I've got. Now, if I was a mama toucan, I would come in with some fruit just like this. There you go. Oh, he's eating the spoon. Look at that beak, quite the chomper. Here we go, coming in, coming in hot. There we go. And although it's a juvenile, that beak could still give me a pretty good chomp, so I want to keep my fingers away from there. That's why I'm using a spoon. Here we go. When fully grown, the toucan's bill can be nearly seven inches in length and will continue to evolve in coloration, being a mix of red, orange, and green. Just like a mama bird, gotta get that way down in there. Okay. So have you ever fed a toucan before? I have never fed a toucan before. It's the first time for everything. Did you know that Fruit Loops is actually my favorite cereal? And as a kid, I used to love Toucan Sam. So hanging out today with this baby toucan, getting to feed it real Fruit Loops, is a pretty cool experience. Oh, give me back the spoon. He's trying to eat the whole spoon. Oh, we've got all kinds of good stuff in here. We've got cantaloupe and pineapple and banana. There you go. You got some of it on your beak. Look at those eyes. Look at how big and buggy his eyes are. And without the feathers fully developed on the neck, you can see the curve of that vertebrae. Look at the feet. Can you see that? You know what it looks like? Reminds me of a baby pterodactyl. These birds have what is known as zygodactyl feet, with toe sets facing in opposite directions. This foot structure, with two toes in the front and two toes in the back, allows them to easily maneuver in the lush rainforest canopies. In a baby toucan of this size, obviously up in the trees, it's very important that he uses these claws to keep himself in the nest and on the tree branches. Now this baby toucan eats four times a day and quite a bit of food. Oh, I know, I hear you. More, 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 he says. You okay? There you go. It's always nice to have a friend over for a breakfast conversation. And right now we're talking about what it's like to be a baby toucan. It's a rough life if you fall out of the nest. If a baby toucan falls from the nest, it's almost certain to be picked off by a predator. However, in the case of this lucky little bird, it was found by a human who did the right thing and brought it to the sanctuary. Now hopefully this baby toucan will be able to be rehabilitated and eventually released back into the wild. So we don't want to become too acclimated to humans, but it is important that this bird does eat several times a day to keep up its nourishment. And you are one sloppy eater, you know that? He is a sloppy eater. I think you're getting more of this fruit on the log than you are in your mouth. Oh, look at his little tail. Look at that little tufter. Want some more? Yes, that's a good breakfast, isn't it? This right here is the breakfast of champions. Fruit for the Fruit Loops toucan. There you go. Oh, it's like feeding a baby dinosaur. Because this toucan could not be returned to its nest, it will be raised in captivity and will become a permanent resident at Alturas. And whether you are covered in fur or feathers, each and every member of this incredible family of animals is living a happy and loved life. How awesome was that? Spending the morning feeding a baby toucan. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. Eat your breakfast. We'll see you on the next adventure. The Alturas Wildlife Sanctuary is constantly welcoming new volunteers to help with the rescue, rehabilitation, and release of Costa Rica's beautiful animals. For more information on how you can become a part of the team, visit their website, alturaswildlifesanctuary.org.